Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. We also love hearing from our listeners. If you have any suggestions for future audiobooks, please feel free to leave a comment below. Or if you want to say hi, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening, and we hope you have a great day. Subscribe to this channel today, and join the Billionaire Romance Audiobooks family. Saved by the Boss A Doctor Romance Audiobook Book 2 in the Secret Babies series By Michelle Love Audio Copyright 2023, BFA Publishing Note we edited this romance audiobook to comply with the YouTube content guidelines. If you want to listen to the full-length non-edited version, you can grab a copy from Google Play Books or Kobo. Blurb Romy Sass, a young surgical resident, returns to her hometown Seattle and immediately meets her new boss, superstar surgeon Blue Allende. The attraction between them is immediate and intense, and there's a twist. Romy's mom is about to marry Blue's father. Soon, Blue and Romy are falling in love and enjoying a sizzling relationship. Finally, Romy feels she has escaped her past and her violent ex. As Christmas approaches however, a series of horrific murders brings the past back to haunt the couple, and they face the most serious test to their love yet. Will the holiday season bring resolution, and a happy ever after? Chapter 1 Seattle Romy shoved her chestnut brown hair up into a ponytail as she jogged quickly along the hospital corridors. Damn Seattle traffic. She had been so organized right up until she'd hit the traffic accident on the Alaskan Way viaduct. Now she'd missed the first few minutes of rounds and on the worst possible day. So not a good first impression to make. Still cursing herself, she hurried to catch up with her colleagues in the general surgery department. Rounding the corner at a fast clip, she heard his voice before she saw him, a deep mellifluous tone which she knew made woman weak. She might never have met the man, but his voice was as legendary as his surgical skills. Oh yeah. And his body. People talked about that in the same breath as his medical accomplishments. He spoke again and she thrilled at the husky hint of an accent, Italian maybe, in it. If the infection worsens we'll consider a shunt, but in all likelihood, it will resolve rapidly since it was caught at the outset. Romy blinked in surprise at the words. Blue Allende, he of the oh-so-sensual voice, was a superstar surgeon. Not even forty years old, he was at the top of his game, and also at the top of most hospitals' wish lists. With the reputed looks of a movie star and the serious, brooding intelligence of someone a lot older, Blue Allende's reputation preceded him. So why was he standing around with a motley crew of doctors, nurses, and interns, discussing something as mundane as a shunt? It gave her pause and jump-started her liking for the man who, apparently, wasn't your average arrogant genius surgeon. But Romy was still late, and no doctor appreciated tardiness, particularly not one with such a packed schedule. Damn it. Stopping outside the door, she saw a bunch of other residents and slipped in among them, hoping she wouldn't be noticed and knowing she didn't stand a prayer. Her friend Mac, an affable African-American with a sweet face and a wicked sense of humor, grinned and nudged her. Late for the rock star sass, he hissed, genius move. Romy poked him with her elbow, rolling her eyes. What did I miss? Suddenly the crowd of doctors parted, and she saw him where he'd been leaning over a sedated patient. Her breath caught in her throat as Blue Allende turned bright green eyes on her. All the usual hospital noises faded into the background as she was caught in that fiercely intelligent gaze. Geez, Romy thought, this man doesn't belong in an operating theater, he belongs on a catwalk or on the cover of Vogue. He was gorgeous. The bright green eyes were surrounded by thick black eyelashes on a face carved from Italian marble. A shock of dark curls fell messily about his head, then she noticed his wide, sensual mouth set in a thin line. Ah shit. 
She'd like to have seen that mouth in something other than a scowl. Dr. Sass, welcome. That voice from up close. Wah wah wah. And he knew her name? Romy prayed not to stutter. Apologies for my tardiness, Dr. Ayende. It won't happen again. Was that a hint of amusement that flashed in those devastatingly beautiful eyes, and maybe a slight hitching up of the mouth? No sooner had Romy thought she'd seen it than it was gone. He turned back to his patient, and Romy was grateful he hadn't shamed her in front of everyone else. One more point in his favor big time. Got away with it, Mac muttered in her ear, and Romy sighed with relief. As they moved through rounds, she was impressed by Allende's in-depth knowledge of his cases, and the way he coaxed the residents to find answers to his questions, rather than merely lecturing. Even when they got a fact wrong, he didn't sneer or bark at them. Furthermore, he treated patients like friends, addressing them with as much candor as compassion, taking his time rather than rushing right along. More than slightly blown away by the whole picture, Romy watched him carefully, and was confused when she spotted him, in an unguarded moment when the group was discussing a situation, and he apparently thought no one was paying attention to him. Also not typical. Grandstanding surgeons believed the spotlight was always on them. In that brief second though, she saw something in his eyes that she recognized all too well. Pain. Sorrow. Romy was so distracted by the revelation that she didn't realize the focus had shifted and everyone was staring at her. Suddenly feeling the heat of their stares, she swallowed hard, flushing. I'm sorry, Dr. Ayende, could you repeat the question? The amused look was back, displacing sorrow. I was asking if you could give me the ways we can use to diagnose ankylosing spondylitis? Romy cleared her throat. Of course. She ran through the options and then concluded, of course, the disease is notoriously hard to diagnose, and once identified, it usually is a case of pain management. Opioids have little effect pain-wise, but we could try medical marijuana as a last resort. Hail Mary, said the patient, a young man in his twenties, and they all laughed. As a last resort, Billy. Blue smiled and Romy's entire body reacted to it. It lit up his handsome face, and Romy could feel a beat pulsing inside of her. Stop it, she told herself, do not get a crush on your boss. After rounds, Blue asked to see her in his office. He motioned to the chair opposite his desk and Romy sat down, trembling with nervousness. Was she about to be bawled out for being late? Don't look so scared, he said mildly, his tone neutral but somehow still warm. It's just an introduction. I didn't get to meet you like the other residents. From someone else that would have sounded passive-aggressive. From him it came across as oddly sincere. I'm sorry for being late, Dr. Ayende, she apologized. Happens to us all. Before she could blink at that, he picked up a file and opened it. Dr. Romy Sass, age 29, graduated top of your class at Stamford, did your internship and part of your residency at Johns Hopkins, why transfer here for your last year? Johns Hopkins was very reluctant to let you go, we had to fight for you. Old memories made her cold inside. I had to come home to Seattle. Personal reasons. Also, my mother is getting married, rather unexpectedly. And she needs you to be here? Romy hesitated. No, it's not that, but... But what? Romy sighed. It was none of his business, but she owed him this much after being late. My sisters, Juno and Artemis, asked me to come. I'm the middle sister, the peacemaker. They have some concerns about mom's fiancé. Really? Blue looked interested, even though Romy couldn't for the life of her figure out why. Or why she just kept talking. It's not that he's a bad person, though I still haven't officially met him yet. But he's so entirely not what we thought mom would go for. Abruptly, she halted, catching herself in mid-ramble. I'm sorry, you really don't need to know this. No, please go on. Romy frowned. Well then you should know, my mom is a free spirit, a rainbow child, a hippie. Look at our names. Blue smiled. Okay, so Juno and Artemis, I get, but Romy? Short for Romulus. Yes, I know it's technically a boy's name, but you see, I was a twin. Fraternal. 
My brother Remy Remus died when we were five years old. Gosh, the pain of it still haunted Romy. Mom thought I was a boy too when she was pregnant, hence the name. So your name is actually Romulus? She was grateful he didn't press her for more details about Remy. No, she managed to change it at the last moment on the birth certificate. Romy is my legal name. And you don't like your future stepfather? I don't know him. Suddenly Blue grinned. I think your mom and Stuart Eames will be just fine. Romy gaped at him in astonishment. How the hell? He laughed, and his face looked even more desperately handsome than ever. Believe it or not, I wasn't interrogating you without an actual purpose. You see, Romy Sass, Stuart Eames is my father. So technically, we're about to be siblings. Welcome to the family, Romy. Chapter 2 Romy was still shell-shocked when she went to her mother's house that evening. Part of it was admittedly from the additional time she'd spent giddily talking in Blue's office, he'd insisted she call him that, and the rest was entirely due to his revelation. Why didn't you tell me Stuart was Blue Allende's father? Magda Sass looked up from the cutting board and grinned at her middle daughter's abrupt greeting. Hello to you too. Because, dear one, Blue said he didn't want you to know right away. He wanted you to be on his service, and thought you might not want to if you knew. Your reputation as a first-class doctor precedes you, honey, and I'm very proud. Romy smiled and hugged her mother. Thank you, Mama Bear. Anyway, Blue told me he will be with us for Thanksgiving. Upon hearing that, she'd been hard-pressed to keep it together in the surgeon's office. Blue in her home, having dinner with her family, why was that weirdly hot? Will it be awkward? her mother asked in concern. Romy hoisted herself up onto the kitchen counter and stole a piece of bell pepper Magda was slicing for salad. I don't think so. Well, at least I hope not. He's a pretty even-tempered guy. Magda smiled. You like him? Yes. He's the most attractive man I've ever met. Yeah, he's nice. Nice was an understatement. He's an incredible surgeon. Watching him is like watching a maestro at work. Speaking of maestros, Magda often changed the direction of conversations on a whim, so Romy wasn't phased. Your sister has a new job. She's going to work for Livia's foundation as a lecturer. Romy's eyebrows shot up. She is. Juno's moving out. Her youngest sister, Juno, was the sister who most resembled their free-spirited mother. Tall and willowy, with a shock of messy blonde hair and a confirmed tomboy, Juno Sass had made music her first love and passion from a young age. She was the cherished baby of the family, and Romy had half-suspected she'd never leave. She is, Magda confirmed, a touch of melancholy in her voice. Eternally supportive of her daughters though she was, Romy knew her mother would struggle with empty nest syndrome. Although I'm trying desperately not to think about that day. She's starting in the new year, so at least we'll have Christmas as a family. With Stuart's family too? Magda shot her a nervous look. Well, yes. If that's okay with you and Artie. Why wouldn't it be? Romy asked. Magda sighed. There is some, how can I put it, some unpleasantness with Stuart's wife. Hopefully soon to be ex-wife if she ever signs the damn papers. She keeps harassing Stuart, usually through her son. Romy raised an eyebrow, not liking the sound of that. What's the son's name again? Gaius. I've only met him once, but he seems friendly enough. Hasn't Blue ever mentioned him? We're careful to keep family stuff away from work, and I don't actually socialize with Blue Allende, remember? We'd never even met until today. He might be my brother soon, but he's still in a league of his own. Romy grinned as Magda rolled her eyes. You mean you don't socialize at all? Romy, you're beautiful, you're young. Don't let what happened in New York stop you from living your life. Romy grimaced, feeling the familiar cold feeling at the memories. Mom. Dacre doesn't know I'm back home, and if he finds out, he'll come here and... I don't want to imagine. 
Her mother looked down at her hands as they continued to move swiftly. Her knife skills in the kitchen as good as any surgeon's were in an operating theater. I hate that you were with him. You're too young to have gone through a divorce or anything else he did to you. Romy marshaled her emotions, reminding herself that those days were long past. She was safe now, however much Dacre Mortimer was an animal. Her leg still hurt from where he'd stamped on it and broken it the previous year, at the same time that he'd almost beaten her to death. Look, at least I learned a lesson, Romy said to her mother now. Don't go on first impressions. Dacre was Mr. Charm until he wasn't. Was that a dig at me? Magda didn't sound upset, just sad. Because I know Stuart and I haven't known each other that long. Romy hopped down to kiss her mother's cheek and gave her a warm hug. Mom, no, it wasn't a dig at you, more one at myself. Magda smiled in relief. Romy, I have never felt like this. Not even with your father, she added apologetically. I figured with dad. Romy nodded, unsurprised. Romy's father, a professor of Magda's back in the day, had never been present much in his daughter's lives. He supported them financially, but soon after Juno had been born, he and Magda had quietly and amicably divorced and James Sass had remarried and moved to London. Being a single mother didn't faze Magda and she'd somehow kept her girls clothed and fed as they grew, bringing them all up to be independent young people who never depended on someone else. The loss of Remy, Romy's brother, had shattered them all, but the four women were as close now as they had ever been. Artemis, Magda's eldest, had followed her father into the teaching profession and now taught physics at the University of Washington. Romy had headed for medical school as soon as she graduated from Harvard, and Juno was a musical prodigy. The one thing James had provided was money for their education, and Magda was grateful for that, she often told Romy. Magda had been brought up in a hippie commune, and she'd carried those values her whole life, finally having reached a point in her life where she could sculpt for a living. Which was why Romy and her sisters had been astounded to hear that Magda was about to marry a multi-billionaire. Stuart Eames had made his fortune in tech and had such a large share of the tech market that no one could compete. Romy was looking forward to meeting the billionaire who had captured her mother's laid-back heart. A random thought occurred to her as she reached for the salad bowl and started to assemble the various ingredients her mother had diced. How come Blue has a different last name? Magda drained the pot of rice she was cooking. He's Stuart's son from an affair. Romy's eyebrows shot up. I think his mother was Italian, Magda went on, confirming at least that suspicion, though Romy was far more interested in the other revelation. So, Stuart had an affair? Magda gave her a warning look. Darling, if you had ever met his wife, you wouldn't blame him. Though Magda was far from conservative, she was fiercely loyal, and it was an unusual stance for her to take. Nevertheless, Romy decided to let it go, at least until she'd had a chance to cross-examine Eames and ensure that he wasn't about to cheat on her mother. Because if he did, she and her sisters would have plenty to say. Mom, she said, suddenly noticing how much food her mother was preparing, you realize there's only four of us, right? Five, Magda flushed bright red and ducked her head. Stuart's joining us. Oh, getting in an introduction under the wire, huh? Romy grinned. I guess I should help you with the rest of dinner, then? Stuart Eames had the same bright green eyes as his son, but his hair was close cropped and white. He had an easy smile that Romy liked, and a friendly manner which made the party all feel at ease. He greeted them all with utmost respect. It's so good to finally meet you. Magda is so proud of you all. Juno, curling herself into a chair, grinned at him. I assure you, we don't deserve it. Artemis, her blonde hair falling gracefully to her shoulders, shot her younger sister a warning look. Don't tease, Juno. Stuart laughed. No, don't stop teasing. Blue and I are always busting each other's chops. It's what families are supposed to do. Speaking of which, do you mind if I just have a quiet word with your mom about something? I swear it'll take no more than five minutes. Sure thing. Left alone, the sisters looked at one another. He's cute, Juno decided, and Artemis chuckled. 
Can you call a 60-year-old cute? Artemis smoothed her skirt down over her long legs, crossing them elegantly. Romy sighed. Of all the sass sisters, she was the odd one out, dark-haired, dark-eyed and small in stature, if not in figure. Where her sisters were all long limbs and athletic, Romy was curvy and petite. She still worked out as much as her siblings, but her figure was always going to be soft instead of athletic like them. Juno and Artemis took after their mother. Romy didn't know where she'd gotten her curves from. She barely remembered what her father looked like. Oh, she knew people considered her beautiful, but she never played it up. Slightly myopic from a young age, she wore glasses instead of contacts and stuffed her long, thick chestnut hair up into a messy bun more often than not. Juno poked her with a foot now. Will you be coming to our traditional Thanksgiving run this year? Giving her sister a cheesy smile, Romy said, Sadly, I'll be working. Roms? Sorry, Romy sang in a not-so-at-all voice. She loathed running, unless it was towards something. Like pizza. Juno sulked while Artemis grinned at Romy. Nice work, Romy. And what with my broken ankle? What broken ankle? Juno shot her eldest sister a confused look. The one I'll mysteriously acquire on Thanksgiving. Artemis laughed and high-fived Romy. Don't blame me when the pair of you get old and fat. Juno sighed dramatically. Then, lowering her voice, she nodded towards the kitchen where Stuart and their mother talking. What do you think? Too early to say. He looks like blue a little. Same eyes. Juno grinned. You got a little crush, Romulus? Romy threw a pillow at her. None of your business, Quisling. Dinner was a fun affair, and Romy decided she liked Stuart very much. He was charming, intelligent, and seemed to adore her mother. Romy noticed, however, that Artemis was a little quieter than normal, and when she questioned her sister afterward, Artemis shrugged. I'm just reserving judgment is all, Romy. We don't know him that well yet. Romy went to work the next day, wondering if she should mention Stuart to Blue, but when she walked into the locker room, the place was in a chaotic state with people running every which way. What's going on? she asked, preparing herself mentally and physically for what would likely be a long haul. There's been an attack at a sorority house, Mac told her, his face pale. Really nasty stuff. Eight girls, three dead. The rest are being brought in here. Ian Day is already operating. Every time she thought she was used to the darker side of her profession, Romy got a reality check. Because truthfully, there was no way to ever get used to innocence slaughtered. Reaching for her scrubs automatically, she asked, Does he want us in the observation room? No. They heard Blue's voice behind them and turned. Clad in bloodstained scrubs, the handsome surgeon looked weary and grim-faced. Romy, you're with me in OR3, Mac, with Dr. Fredericks in OR7, Jim, Molly, and Flynn, emergency room until we can find theaters for the less injured girls. Come on, Romy. She changed and was back in under a minute. Blue briefed her on the way to theater. Patient is Yasmin Levant, 19, multiple stab wounds to the abdomen, shattered left femur, looks like the killer stamped on it, possibly to incapacitate her. We've got ortho coming in, but her abdominal wounds are catastrophic, at least 29 separate wounds. Poor girl. Blue nodded as they went to scrub. Look, Romy, we're going to do everything and anything to save her, but I have to warn you. The odds are against us. She'd expected as much, sadly, but appreciated the warning anyway. After scrubbing, Romy followed him into the operating room, where the victim lay on the table. She was covered in blood and barely breathing, blood bags and saline trying to keep her alive. Automatically, Romy avoided looking at anything but the injuries. Looking at the faces right off the bat when the situation was so dire, it didn't help things. For hours they operated, trying to repair the damage the knife had caused, pumping her full of blood, but at midnight Blue called it. There was nothing else to do. Yasmin Levant was dead. Chapter 3 The adrenaline leaving her system, Romy felt weirdly emotional, horrified, and drained by the experience. 
She waited until almost everyone had left the room before walking up to Yasmin's head. Finally looking at the young girl's still pale face, her dark hair blood soaked to an auburn color, Romy saw herself reflected in the victim's silent still features. She whispered a silent apology for her failure and started removing the tubes from her throat. The nurses will do that, Blue said gently, putting his hand on her back. Romy, unable to speak, just shook her head, and eventually Blue began to help her, both working in silence, until all the medical equipment had been cleared away and Yasmin lay on the table silent and still, but at least with slightly more dignity. Can I wash her face? Romy found her voice breaking as she asked, but Blue, his eyes sad, shook his head. No, we have to keep her secure for the forensic team now. Even all of our equipment will need to be saved. The police will probably want a statement from all of us. Romy looked back down at Yasmin, and a sob choked its way out of her. Who would do this? Why? She felt Blue draw her away from the victim then, and wrap his arms around her. It wasn't what colleagues usually did, but Romy allowed it because she needed it. She leaned into him, tears filling her eyes. I wish I could tell you it gets easier in these cases, Romy, but it doesn't he said softly, his voice achingly sad and kind. The vile things people do to other humans, sometimes there is no reason why. Sometimes people are monsters. Romy nodded and looked up at him, wiping her eyes. I know the type. Blue stopped and his green eyes were intense on hers. For a long moment they gazed at each other before blushing, Romy gave an awkward smile and stepped away. I'm okay now. We'd better go talk to the family. Of course. There was pain in that beautiful voice of his, and Romy wanted to hold him and comfort him as he had done with her, but Blue walked away. She followed him, running slightly to keep up with his long stride. He dwarfed her five foot two by at least a foot, and suddenly he slowed down. Sorry, Piccolo, I'll try not to walk so fast. Piccolo? Little one, he explained, the tenderness in his voice tugging at her heart as much as the hint of a smile. Then as they neared the relative's room, his smile faded. Is this your first one? First murder. Romy's heart began to beat out of her chest. Blue nodded, squeezing her hand. Just follow my lead. They knocked and walked in. A middle-aged woman, terrified, was sitting down, her arms wrapped around herself, and when she saw their faces, she said, No, 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 no. A man, her husband, his face etched with pain, stood. Doc? Please don't tell me. I'm so sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Levant. Despite our best efforts, Yasmin's injuries were too severe and she died a short time ago. The woman collapsed in a sobbing, weeping huddle, and Blue kept talking to her husband as Romy moved to try and comfort Yasmin's mother. There are no words for the regret I feel we feel at your loss. Trying futilely to soothe the mother's unsoothable grief, Romy listened to Blue talk first to Yasmin's father, then watched him take a turn gently addressing her bereft mother, comforting both as best as he could, answering all of their questions patiently and as fully as possible. But the truth was the one question would never be adequately answered. Why? Romy's chest was tight with sorrow but she maintained her composure. Afterward they talked to the police, those questions prolonging the endless night even further. Finally, as dawn began to break over Seattle, Romy went back to the locker room to change out of her bloody scrubs. The room was empty and echoed with each footstep and slam of the locker door. Somehow managing to drag on her jeans and shirt, Romy slumped onto a bench afterward and put her head in her hands. The adrenaline from the surgery was long gone, and now she felt wrecked. Her hip and leg ached from standing too long but she ignored the pain, trying not to break down. She failed and silent hot tears poured down her face. She buried her face in her hands to cry, her entire body trembling. She heard him come in, it was impossible not to in the silence, but she didn't expect to feel his arms go around her for the second time that evening. Gently, he drew her head to his chest. His clean soap and spice smell was familiar now, and Romy pressed her face into his sweater, breathing him in. He stroked her hair and whispered soft Italian words, resting his chin on her head and just letting her weep. When she finally stopped crying, she looked up at him. His eyes were sad, but he held her gaze for a moment before brushing his lips against hers just briefly. 
It was clear from the look on his face that he'd intended it as no more than a reassurance, but the heat that instantly flared between them changed those intentions. They both felt it, so there was not even the slightest chance of denying the chemistry. Blue framed her face with his big hands. Are you sure, Romy? His voice was low and sent shivers of desire through her body. It is wrong, she whispered, looking up into his intensely compassionate eyes. She just died. How can we? Life has to go on, Piccolo, he said softly. We honor those who go before us by continuing to live fully. But if you prefer not to, I understand absolutely. Yeah, we'd better go home. I mean to our own homes, she added, smiling as he chuckled. Somehow they managed to keep their hands off one another long enough to get dressed and walk outside. Down in the parking lot, he stole one more kiss. You're heavenly, he said quietly, but with intensity in his eyes. I'll see you in a few hours. Take some time. I'll cover for you. Romy saw him watching her car as she drove away, her emotions in turmoil. The man knew how to make her body respond like no one ever had. More than that, he seemed to see something in her that she'd thought Dacre's assault had stamped out permanently. There was a goodness to blue, a tenderness to where it wasn't just red-hot searing, but also something more, even this very first time. She wasn't sure she'd be able to keep the secret, but it was sure worth giving it a damn good try. Chapter 4 At home, Romy set an alarm for two hours and fell onto her bed still fully clothed. She groaned when the alarm went off and hauled herself out of bed, finally discarding her work clothes and stepping into the shower. As she ate a quick breakfast, she flicked on the television and watched the reports of the murders. It was an awful idea but she needed to see it somehow, as though it helped atone slightly for being unable to save Yasmin. As thought it might help her understand even slightly. The four deceased young women, savagely attacked in their sorority house, have now been named as Rebecca Folsom, 20, Una White, 19, Madeline Culpepper, 21, and the youngest victim, Yasmin Levant, who at just 18 died last night of her wounds at the Rainier Hope Hospital. Hospital officials say that their best surgeons worked tirelessly to save Miss Levant, but she succumbed to her injuries in the early hours of this morning. Police say the attacker broke in through an open window and attacked each girl in her bedroom before leaving the premises. So far, no suspects have been identified, but the murders mirror a similar case in New York two years ago. Romy swallowed the last of her cereal, feeling sick. She'd forgotten all about the murders in New York. There were monsters everywhere. She remembered her own personal monster, the midnight beatings, the forced intercourse. Rape. Call it what it was, Sass. She drove into work and was assailed by her friends, wanting to know about working with Blue in an emergency situation. Romy, exhausted, was grateful when Mac rescued her, shooing everyone away and bearing her off to the cafeteria. Allende sent me. He saw you come in and knew you'd get caught by the pack. Damn hyenas. Romy smiled at him and at Blue's thoughtfulness. Mac, if it had been someone else but me, we would have been hyenas too. Mac shrugged. Fair point. Are you okay? You look done in. It was a long night. In more ways than one. Is Dr. Allende all right? He had it worse than me. He looks good, but then he always does. True story. Mac grinned at her. So you're not immune to the good doctor's charisma then? I thought you were the one hold out. Romy cursed silently but faked a smile. I'm here to work, not get laid. I'm just saying, out of all us, I reckon you'd be his type. Romy shrugged off the conversation. Did you hear the news this morning? The murders in New York? The same as here. Yeah. Geez, humans, huh? Humans. She agreed. Her pager went off a second before Max. Or summoned. It was evening before she even saw Blue again. There was so much paperwork from the murders and the subsequent medical procedures that Romy was sequestered with a police team most of the day. They went over everything again and again. 
Romy told them again how Yasmin Levant had been stabbed so viciously that her abdominal artery had been shredded, that she had simply bled out before they could attempt any kind of repair. What about her left femur? Debt. Halsey asked her eventually. Did your orthopedic department attend the surgery? Romy nodded. But to be honest, it was secondary to the abdominal wounds. I'm not an expert, but I assume he or she broke her femur to subdue her enough that she couldn't fight him or her off. We're pretty sure it's a him, Halsey said quietly. Romy, overtired, bristled. Because women aren't strong enough to do that to a person? Halsey held his hands up. I meant no offense, Dr. Sass. We found DNA on the victim. Male DNA. Romy backed down. I'm sorry. Bad day. Of course. Look, we need to talk about the survivor's injuries. We got the report that they weren't as serious as the deceased victims. No, that was strange, Romy said. They were badly beaten, and they'll probably need serious psychiatric counseling, but yeah, it is odd that he didn't finish the job, so to speak. Gosh. And Ms. Levant was the only one with a broken femur? Romy's own leg ached and she rubbed it unconsciously. Detective, the femur is the longest, strongest bone in the human body. The force it takes to break it, it would take anger. Rage. It's sadistic too, but then that's what we're talking about here, isn't it? He's a sadist. He is, the detective agreed, then smiled kindly at her. You'll tell your friends to be careful when they leave at night? Romy gave a hollow laugh. Detective, you're talking about everyday life for a woman in this world. Not even halfway through her shift, Romy was hollowed out through and through. She didn't know if she even had the strength to walk out of the hospital for a breath of fresh air when Blue appeared in the break room. He didn't say a word, helping himself to coffee nonchalantly before stepping into the supply closet. She knew he was giving her a chance to choose, and choose she did. Dragging herself out of her seat, she joined him in the small room and locked the door. This isn't keeping it out of work, Dr. Ayende. Blue reached for her. Shut up and kiss me, woman. Reality reasserted itself, and gently she extricated herself from his arms. Bad boy. She wagged her finger at him, and he laughed. Come home with me tonight, and I'll show you just how much of a bad boy I can be. Romy hesitated, but then the lure of his green eyes, his dark curls, and that body. Piccolo, unless you want to sleep, he said softly, studying her face and holding her more gently. No pressure, you understand. It's been a long two days. Another day, if you prefer. No. Romy made up her mind. The best way to honor those who have gone before us is to continue living our lives fully. I'm off tomorrow so I can risk it. Blue flashed a huge grin. Oh, you're off tomorrow, funny thing, so am I. Romy started laughing. I wonder how that happened. Come here. Romy giggled as he pretended to ravish her. Easy, soldier. You're the one who's not going to be able to walk properly, and we still have rounds. Spoil sport. Get over it, Doc. Romy's body felt electrified all day at the thought of what Blue had promised. That electricity gave her a much-needed boost that, paired with caffeine, got her through the remainder of the long hours. But as the day wound down and she walked down to the concession stand to grab a new toothbrush, she groaned inwardly as she saw a tall, blonde, and very familiar figure looping towards her. Yo, sis. Juno grinned, flinging her long arms around her diminutive sister. Hey, boo, what are you doing here? Just finished a class and wanted to say hi. Also, to check out the famous doc, is he here? Romy opened her mouth to answer just as Blue came toward her, grinning. She gave a quick, almost imperceptible shake of the head and cut her eyes to Juno. Blue slowed his pace, his smile faltering in confusion. Dr. Ayende, do you have a moment? Romy said formally. My sister Juno would like to meet you. Understanding now, Blue smiled at Juno, shaking her hand. Hey, nice to meet you at last. You too. Juno's amazed expression was written all over her face as she took in the gorgeous man. Can I call you Blue? 
Of course. Listen, would you ladies like to grab a coffee? Romy was gesturing wildly behind Juno's back, but Blue didn't understand her signal, and when Juno agreed, a little too enthusiastically, Romy sighed. She knew Juno, any excuse to stay at Romy's place overnight in the city, especially if there was a chance to gossip. Damn it. They went for a coffee at a little independent place on 6th Avenue. Blue smiled at Juno. So, we're about to be siblings? Looks like. Juno was stuffing a Danish pastry into her mouth. We haven't met your brother yet, either. Mom's looking forward to Thanksgiving dinner, just a warning. She cooks Brussels sprouts and given it's, she checked her watch, two weeks until Thanksgiving she'll be putting them on to boil about now. Blue laughed. Dooley noted. Dad and I are looking forward to spending that day with you. And your brother? There was a pause, a beat too long. And Gaius. Of course. You don't mention your brother much, Romy said, and saw a flicker of something in his eyes before he gave them a half-smile. We're not as close as you three appear to be. I always wanted a sister. Juno, Romy tells me you're quite the musical prodigy. Ha. Juno grinned at him. She flatters me. But it is my passion, and I'm about to start working for the Gabriella Renault Foundation, down in New Orleans. Just when I move back to Seattle, she moves out, Romy grinned. I might take it personally. Then you'll have to make the most of me while I'm here. Like tonight. I could stay over at your place? Juno looked hopeful, and Romy had to work to keep the disappointment out of her face. Of course, Boo. She shot an apologetic look at Blue, who winked at her and mouthed, don't worry at her. But, Romy added, thinking quickly, I have to be out early tomorrow for a training seminar. All day, I'm afraid. Yes, she does, Blue caught on, trying not to smile. I'm leading that seminar, and I'm very strict about time. One of my things I'm afraid, punctuality. He is. Juno shrugged, surprisingly clueless. Usually she picked up on these things with a terrifying radar. What's the training about? Orthopedics, Blue said smoothly, mostly about the recovery time of someone's gait after strenuous exercise. Romy snorted her coffee from her nose and was embarrassed, wiping her nose. Sorry, went down the wrong way. That's not like you, Blue said innocently, and Romy had to hide her laughter in her tissue. Juno still didn't notice anything, already making inroads on Romy's carrot cake, which she'd left alone. Romy, trying to stop her giggles, cleared her throat. So, yeah, if you don't mind being left alone in the apartment. Of course not. Juno shrugged. Blue's eyes were twinkling. Don't forget we also have that patient we might need to check in on overnight too. I'll page you if I need you. Please do, Romy was enjoying their little game. I'd like to make sure the patient is um, responding to stimulus. It was Blue's turn to hide his laughter now. Do excuse me, I have to use the bathroom. When they were alone, Juno turned to Romy. Well, he's gorgeous and sweet and cute. How do you concentrate on work with a man like that around? A man who will soon be our brother, Romy reminded her, cringing inwardly. She hated lying to Juno, who was so trusting that she would believe anything Romy told her. Also, he's my boss. Ha, flirty boss. But Juno didn't push it. She gave up on the carrot cake, licking cream cheese frosting from her fingers. Look, maybe I will go home tonight. Seems like you're preoccupied with work anyway. But we must, must, must have a sister's night before I leave for New Orleans. Are you going before Christmas? For some reason, Romy was confused about the timeline. Had Juno told her and she'd just forgotten? Only for a couple of weeks, just so Livia can get me trained before she gives birth. Can you believe she's having a baby? I'm just glad she's well enough to. Their friend Livia had been stabbed and shot by a psychopath the year before and had barely survived. Give her a nox my love, won't you? Speaking of gorgeous men. Juno muttered, then grinned as Blue returned. It was so good to meet you, bro, but I think I'm going to head back home, leave you your second in command. She threw her arms around his neck and hugged him. Faintly surprised, Blue smiled and returned the embrace. You're coming to Thanksgiving, right? 
Blue nodded. Just try and stop me. I'm a sucker for overboiled sprouts. Laughing, Juno kissed Romy's cheek and then loped out, garnering the appreciative looks of a table of young men as she walked out of the coffee house. Blue grinned at Romy. So, you're free after all? He sat down next to her and slid his hand along her thigh. Romy wiggled with pleasure. Dr. Ayande? Yes, Dr. Sass? I believe you prescribed me some steamy action earlier, how about you fill my prescription? Blue laughed. That was the worst Dr. Dirty talk I've ever heard, but yes, I need to do that immediately. Gaius Eames tapped on his father's office door, not waiting for a reply before he opened it. Hey, Pa. Stuart looked up over from his computer, annoyed. Gaius, why bother to knock if you're just going to come in anyway? Gaius was unrepentant, shrugging as he flopped into the chair opposite his father. I just get into town and that's the greeting I get? What would I have caught you doing? One of your secretaries? That's enough, Gaius. Stuart glared at his eldest son. Gaius grinned widely, knowing his barb had hit home. Geez, Pa, take a chill pill. I was kidding. How is the lovely Magda? Stuart's face softened. She's wonderful, and looking forward to seeing you at Thanksgiving. You are coming, I take it? Gaius nodded. Although Mom's not happy, yes, I'll be there. Stuart sighed. At this point, I really don't care what Hillary thinks anymore, Gaius. She burned her bridges long ago. I don't want to fight, Pa. Gaius held his hands up. So, Thanksgiving. Will I meet the daughters? I've done my research, two blondes, one brunette. Have they got the same father? I'm just asking, he added as his father looked annoyed, no judgment. As far as I know, yes. Artemis and Juno take after Magda, and Romy after her father, I understand. Anyway, you'll meet all of them then. Have you spoken? To the Italian? Gaius finished his father's sentence. No, but then that's nothing new. Stuart sighed. Blue is your brother Gaius, and it's about time you both grew up. Gaius stayed silent. He would never, ever bond with Blue Allende, and not just because he was his half-brother. The jealous that squirmed in his gut when he thought about Blue's success, his devastating good looks, his decency. Damn. I hear he's working with one of the sass girls. Stuart nodded. Romy. She's in her last year of residency. Blue says she's the best he's ever seen. Gaius chuckled darkly. Is he sleeping with her? Stuart's blue eyes went gray, and Gaius knew he'd gone too far this time. Don't ever talk about one of Magda's daughters like that again. Ever. Forgive me. Gaius tried to keep the sarcasm out of his voice. Look, I just got into town, can I use the condo? I'm assuming you've moved in with Magda already? Close enough. I spend every night there. Here, Stuart reached into his desk drawer and threw Gaius a set of keys. You know the rules. Pa, you realize I'm 42, right? And Charlie Sheen is 50-something. No skanks, no drugs. Not in my condo. Gaius sighed and got up. Fine. Well, I guess I'll see you at Thanksgiving. Stuart relented a little. The man had a soft spot that made Gaius respect him even less. Look, have dinner with me, just me on Tuesday. Gaius masked a smirk. It's a date. At his father's condo, Gaius unpacked, then grabbed a beer from the refrigerator and stretched out on the couch, flicking through the television channels disinterestedly. It was gnawing at his gut the way his father talked about Blue, the pride, the love in his voice. Gaius had been 17 when his father had revealed his affair with Blue's mother. He hadn't blamed his father for straying, he knew his own mother Hillary hadn't been faithful at any point during his parents' marriage, but he'd resented the fact that there was a child. Blue, 12 at the time that his father brought him into their family, was quiet, kind, intense, and everything Gaius wanted to be. Even as a child, Blue's big green eyes, full of intelligence and compassion, garnered him quick acceptance into their family circle, something Gaius had struggled with. However much Blue had tried to befriend his new brother, Gaius, ridden by jealousy, had been uninterested. Gaius gave a humorless laugh. 
Now Blue already had an in with his father's new wife and her daughters too. FM. Gaius grabbed his iPad and typed in a name in the search engine. Dr. Romy Sass. Her photograph came up immediately on the alumni page at Stanford's website, and Gaius studied it. Long dark hair falling in waves past her shoulders, Romy was a doe-eyed beauty with her olive skin, that faint blush of pink in her cheeks, and the curve of her chest in her white coat was promising. Yeah, Gaius thought, if Blue isn't sleeping with her, he's a fool. Gaius read everything he could on the young woman, but there was a surprising dearth of information. Weren't doctors always publishing research? Why were her name and profile not on the website of the Rainier Hope Hospital, but only on the alumni page of Stamford? Did she not want people to know where she was? Intrigued, Gaius took out his phone and dialed. Yeah, Greg? It's Gaius Eames. Yes, good, thanks. Listen, I have a job for you, if you're interested. Yeah, I want you to find out everything you can on a Dr. Romy Sass. She's a resident at Rainier Hope Hospital. Find out what she's hiding, or who she's hiding from. Chapter 5 At the same moment that Gaius set out to find out more about Romy, his half-brother was doing the same thing, albeit in a more physical way. Blue was aware that his physical attributes meant people thought he was a hustler, and he himself had done nothing to dissuade that image, but the truth was, he was careful with his heart. So many women wanted him to look good on their arm, or wanted his cachet as a superstar surgeon to show off. Very few wanted Blue for who he really was underneath the movie star looks, a funny, unabashed geek who just wanted to find someone to laugh with. And very quickly after she'd arrived in Seattle, Romy had shown herself to be just that woman. That they would soon be related by marriage and be siblings, well, they'd have to deal with that later. For now, all he wanted to do was make love to her. He stroked the hair back from her face as they moved together, marveling at the beautiful flush in her face as she came, trembling and sighing his name. They smiled at each other as they caught their breath. For a long moment, Blue stared at her. I wish we could go public, he said regretfully. I want to tell the world about this brilliant, beautiful woman who somehow wants me. Romy laughed. First, thank you for complimenting my intellect first, you get extra points for that. Second, you know you could have any woman you wanted, Blue Allende. Don't be modest. You know it's the truth. It's the accent, he said playfully before letting loose with a string of Italian. Ho incontrato la ragazza più gloriosa e voglio portarla in tutte le mie parti preferite d'Italia e farl vedere da dove vengo. That's unfairly romantic. Romy exclaimed, kissing him. Ah, a weakness, he teased, tickling her ribs and enjoying her writhing against him. Um, yeah. Now, what did you say? There was something about a hoe and glorious ravioli. Blue grinned. I just said I met the most glorious girl, and I want to take her to all my favorite parts of Italy and show her where I came from. Wow. Where did you come from, she wondered. I mean, I know Stuart had an affair with your mom, she trailed off, apparently realizing that wasn't the hottest of pillow talk conversations. He did, Blue nodded, long ago having come to terms with that aspect of his DNA. Technically he was, and regretfully still is, married to Hillary. Just mentioning her name made his gut tense for reasons no one knew but him. But the marriage has been over for years. Mom was a widow. Her husband was killed in a car wreck three years after they married, and she was in mourning for years. Stuart went to Rome for a conference, met my mother, and it was, according to her, like a thunderbolt. Blue rolled over onto his back and gathered Romy back into him, enjoyed her press tight against his chest. I was conceived on that first meeting, accidentally of course, and my mom even gave Stuart an out, said she would raise me alone. Stuart was a stand-up guy. He and my mother, their chemistry was plain to see even when I was a kid, so when my mom died, Stuart didn't hesitate to bring me to the States. That makes me very happy to hear, Romy nodded. Not the affair, obviously, but it doesn't seem like he'll break my mom's heart. No, Blue assured her. He will not, Romy. He made mistakes, yes, but he is a genuinely good man. Romy's face clouded. What is your stepmother like? 
Hillary. Blue gave a humorless laugh, feeling that wrench again. Hillary Eames is an unremittingly vile piece of crap. Sorry if that sounds harsh, but it's the truth. She treated and continues to treat my dad as an ATM machine, but gives the world the impression she's a God-fearing charitable Christian woman. Ah. That woman has never believed in anything in her life. She's that bad? Blue nodded. Thankfully, Dad saw the light and filed for divorce, but it hasn't stopped her from trying to control him. And Dad's so desperate for the divorce to be final, he gives in on everything. She's bleeding him dry. I haven't met your mom yet, Romy, but I would warn her. He looked at her intensely, willing her to feel the depth of his warning, don't let Hillary in even an inch. She's like a cancer, and I haven't even told you the half of it. Romy propped herself up on her elbow and studied him. She won't get a chance, I promise. No one messes with my mom, they have to get past me and my sisters and we can throw down, I tell you. Blue smiled fondly at her. I bet you can. I really look forward to meeting Magda. She's made my dad happy, and I owe her everything for that. Thanksgiving. There was a tiny pause before he nodded at the invitation. Thanksgiving. Yes. He bent his head to kiss her. Now Romy, be a good girl and lie back for me. Artemis Sass drove into the city to do some early Christmas shopping. Her partner, Glenn, had called her to say he would be late home, and Artemis was enjoying the time alone. She and Glenn had not been getting along too well lately, and she knew in her heart that it was over. Still, the thought depressed her. She and Glenn had been together since high school, nearly twenty years, and the thought that they would not be in each other's lives much longer was a deep sadness within her. It turned out that it was true, the whole thing about people outgrowing one another. He'd grown one way and she'd grown the other. There was no longer any chance of them meeting in the middle, though they'd tried for a long time. At 36, Artie had worked her way up in the otherwise male-dominated faculty and was now a tenured professor at the university. There was something missing though, something that wasn't satisfying her in her life, but she couldn't figure out what. She loved her family, she was close to both her sisters and her mother, she had great friends, and yet. Something had been bugging at her for a few weeks now, and she couldn't quite reconcile it with her stoic and practical nature. It was Romy, she realized. She felt her middle sister was heading towards trouble, and she couldn't figure out why she felt like that. Certainly, Romy was fitting in well at the hospital, or so she said, and she was happy in her small apartment, but Artemis couldn't help feeling scared for her sister. Why, though? She asked herself again as she browsed around the department store. Why do I feel like that? Maybe it was Dacre, Romy's ex. He was still out there, still angry with Romy for leaving him. The way he had beaten her the last time still haunted Artemis. The hospital in New York had called her, and she had flown with her mother and Juno to see Romy. Walking into that room, seeing her sister almost unrecognizable, her face bloodied and bruised, eyes swollen, her legs smashed. Romy, thankfully, had pressed charges, but Dacre, thanks to his wealthy parents, had hired the best lawyers money could buy, and the sass women couldn't compete. Dacre had been fined and gave an outward expression of regret, but Romy and her family knew he was enraged by the court case and by the subsequent divorce. Artemis shook herself. Romy is an adult and doesn't need you worrying about her. Get a grip. Artemis asked herself whether she was distracting herself from her failing relationship by focusing so much attention on her sister. She pushed everything to the back of her mind and went to her favorite coffee shop. A gingerbread latte and a pastry later, and she felt the tension leave her body. She was flicking through a book she'd purchased for Juno for Christmas when she felt a hand on her shoulder. Looking up to see a very tall, handsome man, she smiled delightedly. Dan. Dan Helmond. Her old friend grinned back at her. The very one. Hey, kiddo. Artemis stood and hugged him. Dan had been a couple of years old than she and Glenn at school. Now he was a big bear of a man, his dark hair shot through with silver, his beard full. Plaid shirt and camo pants and ear piercings, and Dan looked more like a hell's angel than the architect he was. 
He'd always been a kind, gentle man, though, and all the Sass sisters had had a crush on him at one point or another. Can I get you a coffee? Artemis asked, hopefully. Nah, I just ordered. Can I get you a top-up? Oh, woman, what is that monstrosity? He peered into her half-empty mug, and Artemis grinned. It's a gingerbread latte, you Philistine, and no thanks. One sugary hit is enough for me. Dan excused himself to pay for his own coffee, Americano, no sugar, no cream, and sat down with her. His brown eyes twinkled merrily at her. Well now, girl. You're looking good. How's life? It's good, thanks. I'm tenured at my college, family's good. My mom's getting married soon. Dan looked surprised. Wow, really? Someone's tamed Magda Sass? He always deliberately pronounced their surname Sassy rather than Sass, Artemis remembered. I wouldn't say tamed exactly, you know mom. She's still a head in the clouds nutso, but wonderful with it. Artemis sipped her coffee. She's marrying Stuart Eames. With satisfaction, she saw the amazement on Dan's face. No freaking way. Yes way. Dan let out a long breath. Wow. Wow. One of his sons is in property. Gaius Eames. You know him. Dan shook his head. Heard of him and that star doctor brother of his, but I don't know either. How about you? Still with Glenn? Barely. Yes, we're still um still, together. You don't seem so sure. Artemis shrugged, not wanting to talk about Glenn with Dan and ruin the atmosphere. How about you? Wife passed a few years back, cancer. Dan stirred his coffee, clearly lost in those memories for a long moment, such that Artie reached over and touched his hand. I'm sorry, Dan. He nodded and looked up briefly covering her hand with his, and then going on as if he hadn't missed a beat. I have a 17-year-old daughter, Octavia. She's heading off to Harvard next year. That's exciting. Dan beamed and Artemis felt her stomach flutter. That smile. She's my angel. Dan went on, digging out his wallet and showing her a photograph of a pretty teenager with long dark hair and big soulful brown eyes like her father. She's gorgeous. She could be Romy's twin. She could. How is your sister doing? Last I heard, she was in New York. Artemis felt her chest tighten. She's back now, working as a resident at Rainier Hope. Surgical superstar in the making, so they say. I'm not surprised. And Juno? About to work for a charitable foundation in New Orleans. Man, the Sass sisters done good. Artemis smiled. We're doing okay. Dan glanced at his watch. Listen, Missy, I hate to cut and run, but I have a meeting in town. Don't suppose you'd like to make this a regular thing? Meeting up for coffee? Tavia's always telling me to slow down, take some time to chill, and I'd like to see you again. I'd love to, here. She pulled a business card out of her pocket, a little worse for wear. It has my cell phone number on it. Call anytime. It was really great to see you. Dan bent down and kissed her cheek. Soon, yeah. Soon. Artemis felt absurdly cheered as she walked back to her car. A new friend, she thought to herself, a new friend that's an old friend. She pushed away any thoughts of anything beyond friendship, although she kept rerunning Dan calling her Missy, she'd forgotten that was his name for her back in high school. When she got home, Glenn was in a cheerful mood, and they enjoyed a pleasant meal together for the first time in a long time. When Glenn had gone to bed in his own room, where he'd moved a long time back, Artemis checked her phone to see Dan had already sent her a text message, a photograph of him and his daughter giving her the thumbs up. Sweet and funny. She went to bed with a huge smile on her face. From another coffee house across the street, Dacre Mortimer had watched his ex-wife's sister chatting with the tall man. He knew Artemis wouldn't hesitate to call the cops on him if she saw him, and he couldn't risk being caught, not while Romy was still out there in the world alive. He didn't much care what happened to him after she was dead, but for now, he had a job to do. Find Romy. Find his beautiful, love-of-his-life ex-wife Romy. And kill her. Chapter 6 
Dr. Allende, can I see you about a consult, please? Romy hid her grin as Blue looked up from his paperwork and his eyes twinkled at her. Of course, Dr. Sass. Where to? In less than a minute, they had locked themselves into a supply closet on the quietest floor in the hospital. Finally, as they caught their breath, Romy laughed and shook her head at him. You are a machine, Allende. Love machine. He gave her the finger pistols and she chuckled. And you are so cheesy, so, so cheesy. He kissed her, then helped her straighten her clothes. Listen, I was thinking, we should talk about birth control. How to Kill a Mood in 10 Seconds by Dr. Blue Allende. But she grinned at him. What are you thinking? We're both doctors and we both have access to, um, tests. Does that sound selfish? I don't mean it to, I just... I want to be close to you. Oh damn, I sound like a creep. I'm not explaining this well. Romy shook her head. No, but I understand what you're trying to get at. And I want that too. She leaned into him and nuzzled his nose with hers. Skin on skin, she said in a low, chocolatey voice, you and me together. Damn woman, how come I couldn't put it like that? Romy chuckled. Dr. Allende? Yes? With that, Romy grinned, picked up her files, and headed for the door. She blew him a kiss and left him in the closet. Romy was still grinning when she was called to the emergency room 45 minutes later. A nervous young intern came to find her. Hi, Dr. Sass. I'm sorry to call you personally, but there's a patient asking for you. He's in curtain six. Name? He won't give me it. Romy's heart began to thump unpleasantly. Surely not. Surely Dacre hadn't found her already. She smoothed her face out and nodded at the intern. No problem, I'll see him. For one awful moment before she pulled back the curtain, she imagined it was her violent ex-husband that he would lunge for, get his hands around her throat, choke the life out of her. The relief when she saw the patient was immense, and she smiled at the man, who was cradling a bloody hand. He smiled at her. Dr. Sass? That's me, mister. The man grinned, his handsome face lighting up, his blue eyes intense. Eames. Hey, Romy, I'm Gaius, your soon-to-be stepbrother. Her eyebrows shot up as she searched for a resemblance to Blue, and definitely saw it, now that she was looking for it. The high cheeks and sculpted jaw were apparently genetic. Hey, well, hey, she stammered and then laughed. Wow, you caught me off guard. Nice to meet you at last, even if unexpectedly. Gaius held his hand up. I was careless while fixing my car. Let's take a look. Romy pulled up a chair and took his hand. You didn't want to see Dr. Allende? I wanted to meet you. Something good to come out of this. Ouch. Sorry. Romy examined the nasty gash. Well, it's deep, but you won't need surgery. I'll clean it and give you some local anesthetic. Then we can stitch the wound or even glue it. Gaius nodded, his eyes never leaving her face. Thank you, Romy. As she worked, he asked her questions about her work. Do you work closely with Blue? Was there an edge to his voice? She kept her tone neutral. Well, he is our general surgery attending, and that's my chosen specialty. It's strange to think he'll be my brother soon. I bet. I didn't think to ask Dad, have they settled on a wedding date? I don't think so, but Mom's being really secretive about it. Lord knows why, she's not usually shy about anything. Of course, your father's divorce isn't quite final yet, so there's that to consider. Gaius laughed. Secrets are overrated. Do you have any secrets, Dr. Sass? His voice dropped lower, quieter, and Romy flushed, not out of pleasure but awkwardness. He was flirting with her, and it was freaking her out. For a second, she imagined saying, well, your half-brother just reamed me real good in a supply closet, but apart from that, nope. Boring, I know, but that's me. We're all done here. She gave him a smile and pushed away from him. The nurse will come to stitch you up. He reached out and took her arm. Romy, thank you. To say thank you, I'd love to take you to dinner. What do you say? Romy stepped gracefully away from his grip. 
Well, we'll see you at Thanksgiving in a couple of days, and I'm afraid I'm pretty much working until then. Gaius reached for her hand and kissed the back of it. Instead of the heat that flared through her when Blue touched her, Romy felt her skin go weirdly cold. Then I shall have to be satisfied with that. After he left, Romy felt unsettled. Gaius was all charm and politeness, but there was something underneath the facade, something that made her feel uneasy. She wondered if she should tell Blue that his brother had been in, but eventually decided not to. It was nothing, after all. She didn't regret her decision that night when Blue dropped a sheet of paper in her lap as he was pulling off his tie. Blood tests. She scanned them and grinned up at him. Dude, some of these tests take weeks. How did you manage this? Well, honey, let me just say, there's a very happy guy in testing right now. Romy giggled at the mischievous look on Blue's face. Blue Allende, did you pimp yourself out for tests? Kinda, but not in the way you mean. He might have needed half a week off for a family destination wedding, and I might have pulled some big strings. Allende bribery, she teased. That's all kinds of wrong. More than anything, Romy felt she could trust him, and after what Dacre had done to her, it was a big thing for her. She did tell him that she felt she could trust him, leaving out the parts about Dacre, and to her surprise, Blue looked utterly moved. I'm glad, Piccolo. I'm honored by that, and you should know. I feel the same. Whatever this is between us, whatever it becomes, you are my person. My lover, my muse, my best friend, and my family. Romy's eyes filled with tears. And you mine. Blue kissed her tenderly. Thank God you came home to Seattle, Romy. Thank God. And they began to make love again, loving each other long into the night. Gaius smiled grimly to himself as he sat in his car outside his half-brother's apartment. He had followed Romy from the hospital and could hardly believe it when she drove here. He saw Blue come down to greet her, saw them kissing. So his half-brother was sleeping with his almost stepsister. Gaius' gut churned with jealousy. Romy Sass was beautiful, sweet, and of course, Blue had gotten there first. Damn you. Still, it would make for extra sport, Gaius grinned to himself. Romy Sass had a whole lot of secrets that he would bet his life Blue didn't know about. The abusive ex-husband, for one. Dacre Mortimer. Son of New York socialites, a billionaire in his own right. So, Romy liked the money. That would be useful, although Gaius could see from the divorce papers that she had not asked for a penny from Mortimer, not even the prenup money she had been entitled to. That was interesting. Gaius also knew Romy had been hospitalized a year previously as she was about to enter her last year of her residency program at Johns Hopkins. Smashed left femur, multiple wounds from a beating, bruised liver, and a burst ovary from being kicked in the stomach. Mortimer's parents had done a good job hushing it up in the papers, but their son had gone to town on Romy when she'd asked for a divorce. Why the hell had she married him? Gaius couldn't figure it out, but if he could find Mortimer, he would ask him. Romy had fled New York as soon as she was well enough and applied to Rainier Hope to finish her residency. A new life. Hum. Gaius began to see a whole campaign of terror he could unleash on the couple especially if he could find Dacre Mortimer and lead him to his ex-wife. He smiled when he thought of watching Dacre confronting his ex-wife, of Blue finding out what had happened. Blue would defend Romy, of course, and maybe Dacre would get rid of Blue once and for all. Gaius got excited now. Yes, yes, this was perfect. If he could manipulate Mortimer into killing Blue, then he, Gaius, could sweep in and save the day. Poor Romy would be devastated, unless of course she too was dead. Gaius shrugged. Either way, he would win. He picked up the phone and called his detective, thanking him for finding out all the information he had already collected, then paused. I'd like you to do something else for me, and I'm willing to pay you double if you can do it. I'm intrigued. Go ahead. Gaius smiled. Find out where Dacre Mortimer is, and ask him to meet with you. I have a very interesting proposition for him. Chapter 7 On Thanksgiving morning, Magda took one look at her fiancé's somber face and sighed. Oh, oh. What did she do now? 
It had almost become a joke between them. Hillary Eames' attempts to draw out her divorce from Stuart were creative. Magda had to give her that. But Stuart was being worn down by it, his usually merry green eyes losing their sparkle. Magda stood on her tiptoes to kiss him. She was a tall woman herself, but Stuart was a big man, broad-shouldered and long-limbed. He wrapped his arms around her now. I can't make head or tail of it, Mags. She's dropping her objections to the divorce. For a moment, Magda was so shocked, she couldn't speak. After months and months of vicious back and forth between Hillary and Stuart, Hillary was dropping her claim for 75% of Stuart's wealth. How? And more importantly, why? Magda had only met Hillary on two occasions, but it was enough to get a measure of the woman. She liked power and she loved money. Hillary Eames would not drop her claim to Stuart's billions. What the hell? Magda studied Stuart, who looked lost. I just don't know, but I don't trust it. Magda shook her head. No. Did you call Gaius, ask him if he knew anything? I did, and he doesn't. He's as bemused as I am. He said he would call her and report back later at dinner. Magda blew out her cheeks. So, she's signing the divorce papers? Stuart smiled now. She is, which means my beautiful Magda, we can get married. And soon. I was thinking. Christmas. It'll be finalized that soon? Stuart gave a wry grin. Sometimes being rich helps. Money bags. But she kissed him, laughing softly. I love you, Stuart. If you didn't have a penny, I would still love you to the moon and back. Mushy. But he kissed her tenderly, tangling his fingers in her short steel gray hair. Gosh, woman, you are beautiful. She smiled up at him. Well, you're old. Your eyesight is fading and ouch, ouch, no, stop that, she shrieked as he tickled her. Juno wandered in, hopping up onto the counter and watched them. Is this some kind of cocoon foreplay? Magda shot her youngest daughter a withering look. We're not that old. Maybe I don't mind so much that you're moving out, after all. Juno smirked and blew her mom a kiss. You love me. Stuart laughed at their antics. Hey kiddo, he said to Juno, I'm trying to persuade your mother to marry me at Christmas. Help me out, would you? Juno's eyes went wide. Vampire has signed the divorce papers? Yup. Juno did a seated dance of victory, hands raised high in the air. Yeah, baby. Then hell yes ma, snag this dude before I steal him away from you. Can I officiate? Magda and Stuart looked at each other. Can you get ordained before Christmas? Juno looked smug. Already am. I was waiting for you to announce your wedding day, then I was going to surprise you. What do you say? I say I forgive you for the cocoon crap, Magda beamed, hugging her youngest tightly. Stuart, yes? No. Stuart grinned. I think that would make the day even more perfect, yes. Now all we have to discuss is where. Magda laughed. Okay, you two, slow your roll. Let's get today over and done with. Juno, are your sisters on their way? Artie is, but Romy said she might be a little late. Emergency at the hospital, and she said that she and Blue might come together for convenience's sake. That's cool, but I hope they don't get tied up. Now they lay side by side, sleepy and exhausted. Blue grabbed the alarm clock and set an alarm for 2 page M, don't want to be late for your mom. He grinned, but then saw Romy had fallen asleep, her head resting in the crook of his shoulder. Blue studied her face, so lovely, so expressive even in repose. He knew he was in love with her, had been for weeks now, almost since the first, but Blue struggled with whether to tell her or not. They needed to get this dinner with their parents over with, then decide whether or not to go public. The only person Blue had told was his chief of surgery, Bo Quinto, not wanting any improper behavior on his record, nor to let his mentor and friend down. It isn't a fling, Bo, he told him seriously. I'm crazy about her, but it won't affect either my work or Romy's. We're professionals. Yes, Romy and I work closely together, but I assure you I don't favor her above the other residents. He grinned slightly. Even if she is the best general surgery resident I've ever seen. 
Kinto had rolled his eyes. Blue. I've been where you are. When I met Dinah, she was a patient, so I know all about improper relationships. I trust you and Romy not to let your relationship interfere with your work. Don't let me down. I won't, I give you my word. Thanks, boss. Blue laid his head on top of Romy's and closed his eyes. Feeling her in his arms was like a drug to him. He loved her brain, her commitment to her work, to the hospital. Gosh, he dreamed of finding a woman like Romy all his adult life. The only person who had ever gotten close was Julia, his college sweetheart, but she had had an affair with Gaius during their final year at Harvard. When a vindictive Gaius had dumped her soon after, Blue had had no interest in resuming the relationship, though he hadn't wished his brother's cruelty on her. He wouldn't wish it on anybody. Gaius had always been resentful of Blue, of anything he had that Gaius didn't. Success, focus, commitment, Gaius thought these things were something one either had or didn't have, rather than things one would work for. Blue had no time for his feckless older half-sibling, and even less time for his stepmother. Hillary had made Blue's mother's life a misery while she was alive, and continued to besmirch her memory after death. He shook himself now. Later, he would have to see Gaius, and not give away that he was in love with Romy. He had nightmares about Gaius setting his malevolent sights on the beautiful young woman in his arms. Of course they were nothing to the other nightmares that had plagued him ever since the eight young women were brutalized in the city, since Yasmin Levant had died on his operating table. She had looked like Romy, too much for Blue not to imagine it was his love bled out and dead in the OR. His arms tightened reflexively around her now, and he pressed his lips to her forehead. Romy murmured in her sleep and opened her eyes, smiling up at him. He kissed her soft lips, treasuring every moment before she sighed and went back to sleep. Gosh, I love you, Piccolo. He hadn't exaggerated when he'd told her he wanted to whisk her away to Italy, to show her every place he'd loved as a child, everywhere he had been at his happiest, until he'd met her. He closed his eyes and slept then, with that happy dream in mind, until the alarm went off at 2 page m, and he and Romy made love again, before finally dragging themselves from their beds to go celebrate Thanksgiving with their blended family. You are mine, he growled at her continually. He'd worn her down over the months to be able to get her to agree to marry him, destroying her confidence, isolating her from her friends. By the time of the wedding, fifteen minutes at City Hall, Romy had been a shadow of her former self. Dacre still wasn't certain how he'd scared her so much that she'd actually agreed to be legally bound to him, but such was his power, he now remembered proudly. That, and keeping her away from her damn nosy family so they couldn't run interference. She'd spoken her vows in such a quiet voice the judge had had to ask her to speak up twice, but when she had seen the barely concealed rage on Dacre's face, she had quailed and recited them louder, but in a monotone. Dacre had seen the two witnesses, strangers he had wrangled from a bar, exchange concerned looks. The woman with them had slipped Romy her number. If you need anything. He knew Romy hadn't called her. It would have made no difference if she had. Dacre killed the woman, Regan, a few weeks later, catching her unawares as she stepped out into a dark alley in the back of the bar where she worked to have a smoke. Hand across her throat, knife in her belly, one, two, three. Dead. Gosh, the feeling, the rush it gave him, and every single time he imagined his victim was Romy. That last one, the final one, had begun when she was late home from the hospital and he'd been drinking. Such a normal thing, but he'd heard her coming up the stairs and for a moment he had just been joking around, hiding behind the door to spook her. He had hooked his arm around her neck and she had screamed in fright. Pulling away from him, she'd rounded on him with wide, frightened eyes, so beautiful in her terror, and told him she was leaving him for good. Dacre had lost it. He'd beat her mercilessly until she could no longer stand, blood pouring from cuts above her eyes, her nose broken, her mouth bleeding. He'd pulled her hair until she sobbed, then, as she slumped to the floor, he had stamped on her left thigh, and they'd both heard the decisive crack as her femur shattered. Romy, choking on her own blood, could no longer scream for help. Dacre had studied her dispassionately, then, grabbing a knife from the block, had raped his broken wife. 
He had intended to kill her, he knew that now, but when he'd heard his neighbors shouting, banging on the door, he chickened out. Instead, he'd called an ambulance for Romy, turning on the waterworks, apologizing over and over, begging her to live. At the hospital, the police had arrested him, and he'd made a great show of not protesting. Secretly, he had been waiting for his lawyer to tell him Romy was dead, that her injuries were too bad. The police had discovered who he was, and their whole attitude had changed. His father had friends high up in the NYPD. He had been cautioned and told that if Romy pressed charges, they would have to revisit. His mother and father had been beside themselves with grief. They had adored Romy and had thought she would be able to tame some of Dacre's excesses. When it became clear Romy would live and that she would be throwing the book at him, Dacre's father, Hubert, had paid off the people he needed to drop the charges in return for a plea deal. No jail time for Dacre. Romy and her family had fought back, but they were no match. In return, Romy had been given her divorce, but would not take a penny from the Mortimers. Hubert Mortimer had given his son a check for $3 million and then cut him off. His parents had disowned him entirely. And you are to blame, Romy Sass. You shouldn't have made me angry. Dacre parked his car behind the tree line of the forest, which bordered Magda Sass's property, and stepped out to slink closer to the house. He saw a car pull up and saw a dark-haired man and Romy get out. They were laughing and joking. Gosh, Romy looks so beautiful. Who was this guy with her? The next moment, he watched as the man pulled Romy into a small corner of the house, shaded from the windows, and kissed her. Romy gazed up at the man with love in her eyes, and it made Dacre's insides twist in rage. Damn skank. How dare she cheat? Because she was still his, in spite of the divorce. She'd vowed forever and she would always be, no matter her whoring ways. She's exquisite, isn't she? Dacre started and turned to find a tall, amused-looking man with piercing blue eyes staring at him. Dacre was lost for words. The man held his hand out. You must be Dacre Mortimer, he said in a friendly tone. He nodded towards the couple who were now disappearing into the house. And that's my half-brother Blue Allende kissing your ex-wife. And yes, they're sleeping with each other. Sickening, isn't it? And who the heck are you? Gaius Eames. Hello, Mortimer. I think we're going to have a lot of fun together. Chapter 8 Romy was beginning to feel really uncomfortable. The meal had started off well. Everyone had been formally introduced, and the food was out of this world. If there was one thing Magda excelled at apart from parenting and sculpting, it was cooking. The turkey was juicy and plentiful, the side dishes of creamy mashed potatoes and yams sweet and heavenly, the gravy well seasoned. Even the cranberry sauce was made from scratch, and Blue grinned at her as she went in for another helping. She shrugged unrepentantly. It's my favorite. The worst part of the meal was not giving away that she and Blue were together, not sharing those intimate glances or private jokes between them. They'd slipped a couple of times but had written it off as work jokes. Everything had been going really well until Gaius turned his attention to her. Nice to see you again so soon, Romy. Oh shoot. How's the hand? She could feel Blue staring at her curiously. Much, much better, thanks to you. Gaius appeared friendly, even if there was an undercurrent. He looked at Blue. She's quite remarkable, Blue. Have you noticed? Of course, Blue smiled smoothly, but the edge in the smile was one Romy hadn't seen before and it made her cold. Romy is by far the best resident at Rainier Hope this year. And for many years come to that. You sound impressed, brother. Blue fixed Gaius with a searching stare. I am, Gaius. When did you and Romy meet? Romy opened her mouth to speak but Gaius got there first. A couple of days ago, you didn't mention it, Romy. His face was a picture of innocent confusion. Patient privacy, Romy said quietly. She risked a glance at Blue, who met her gaze steadily. There will be questions later, his eyes said, and she gave a quick, almost imperceptible nod, believing with every fiber of her being that he might be upset but would not hurt her as Dacre had done any time he was enraged. 
the consummate professional, Gaia said. Artemis cleared her throat, picking up on the sudden tension. I actually have some news. Romy shot her a grateful smile. Is everything okay? Oh yes, well no but yes and I know that doesn't make sense. Glenn and I have decided to break up. Now I know you'll think this is a bad thing mom, but for both Glenn and I, we've grown apart. Neither of us thinks badly of the other, it's just we no longer fit as a couple. Glenn's moving out, today actually, which is why he couldn't be here. It's entirely amicable, I assure you, so there's no need to pick sides, etc. I'm glad, Juno said immediately, but you know we've always got your back, Artie. Artemis grinned at her. I know you do, Bubba. But yeah, so? I guess I'm just saying I'm single, and happily so for now. As long as you're happy, darling, Magda looked a little upset but smiled at her eldest daughter, always supportive. Artemis leaned over and squeezed her hand. I am, Mom, and so is Greg. So, can anybody cheer proceedings up? Mom Stewart? She grinned at them. I hear someone very special is going to marry the two of you. Juno beamed as Romy and Blue looked surprised. Really, Juno? That's awesome. Hey, Romy said in a stage whisper to her sister, when they get to the kissing bit, can you leave that out? I don't want to see that. Magda threw a Brussels sprout at her daughter. Cheeky girl. The rest of the meal passed in easy conversation and laughter, but Romy could feel the tension rolling off Blue's body. It didn't help that Gaius, pretending there was a friendship between he and Romy, made jokes with her, flattering her as if they had known each other for more than a few moments. Romy saw her sisters looked confused at the strange behavior, and when they got her on her own, clearing the dishes, they questioned her about it. Romy shrugged. I don't get it either. I treated him for his hand wound, that was it. I don't know the man. Perhaps he's just trying to, I don't know, ingratiate himself. Then why isn't he all pally-pally with me and Artie? Juno shook her head. Guy's a creep. For God's sake, Juno, lower your voice. Artemis hissed at her, and Juno rolled her eyes. Romy felt a lump of misery settle in her chest. She should have told Blue that he was pissed was obvious, to her at least. Damn it. She looked at Artemis, and for a moment debated telling her about how she felt about Blue. No, it wasn't fair to him, they had vowed to keep it quiet, at least until after Stuart and Magda's wedding. She turned back to the dishes, only half listening as her sisters chatted. Eventually, she was alone in the kitchen, making work for herself. She felt a hand on the back of her neck and turned hopefully, expecting to see Blue. She jerked backwards when she saw it was Gaius instead. He held up his hands. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle to you, Romy, it just seemed like you were tensed up there. Romy was trembling. Gaius, please don't touch me unless I ask you to. Sorry. His smile was innocent, but his eyes sparkled with malice. Guess you're always a little jumpy these days. After what your husband did to you in New York. Romy was so shocked that she didn't see Blue enter the kitchen behind her, as Gaius started to grin. It was only when she heard him put down the casserole dish he was carrying that she turned, and saw the hurt in his eyes. He gazed back at her for a beat then turned and walked out. Romy stared after him in dismay. Was it something I said? Gaius asked and laughed coldly. Chapter 9 Blue was silent as he drove Romy back to her apartment. Romy sat in miserable contemplation as he followed her into her small apartment and shut the door. In spite of her total trust in him, her nerves were tightly wound, fear unavoidable. She waited for the storm as they walked into the living room, but he just grabbed a bottle of scotch from her kitchen with two glasses and sat her down next to him. Now, he said quietly, calm and patient, the utter antithesis of Dacre, tell me everything. Romy took a deep breath in, pressing her hands tightly together. It's true, I was married, although I don't know how the hell Gaius knew. Incidentally, he's an asshole for behaving as if he and I were better acquainted than a five-minute consult the other night. Blue nodded slowly. But you didn't tell me about it. No, and right now, I don't know why. 
Blue, he's a creep, and he came on to me then as well as tonight. He makes my skin crawl. Blue looked slightly mollified. That's Gaius all right. But why didn't you tell me you were married? We weren't, aren't there yet. You've never told me about your past lovers, either. Don't do that, Romy. No games. Husband is a lot different from girlfriend. Who was he? Romy looked at him steadily. He was a violent, ignorant, spoiled rich boy who tried to kill me. There. Now you know. What? Blue said in obvious horror. Romy was glad he was shocked. That's why I didn't tell you. I don't like to talk about it, frankly. It's a lot more complicated than just, I was married. He regularly beat me and raped me, then when I told him I wanted a divorce, he assaulted me so violently that I nearly died. He comes from a rich family. He's arrogant, entitled. Dacre Mortimer is a monster and if he finds me, I'm dead. So, the fewer people that know about him, the fewer people there are both in his firing line and who can help him find me. Why do you think my photo and name aren't on the Rainier Hope website or in promotional material? He knows I live in Seattle, he just doesn't know where. She sighed and rubbed her face. Obviously, Gaius has done his homework. Geez, Romy. Blue got up and paced around. Why did you marry him in the first place? That's a question I still can't answer fully for myself, she said softly. He cowed me separated me from my mother and sisters. I guess after months of non-stop abuse, you get broken down to where a person can make you do just about anything. Even marrying the devil himself. To Romy's great relief, Blue came back to her and put his arms around her, holding her tightly. He buried his face in her hair, and Romy was shocked to feel him shaking. Blue. The thought of anything happening to you. His voice was muffled, and his arms tightened around her. It's okay, baby, nothing's going to happen to me. Romy made him look at her, and she stroked his face, wondering how she could ever have wondered even slightly if this man would hurt her. He was such a good man, gosh. How had she gotten so lucky this time? I'm sorry I didn't tell you about Gaius. I just didn't want to upset you. That's clearly what he wants to drive a wedge between us. Blue pressed his lips to hers. Romy, that won't ever happen. I won't let it. I'm in love with you. The thought of anyone hurting you kills me. It was Romy's turn to cry now. I love you too, Doc, she smiled through her tears and he kissed her passionately. In the morning, Romy was changing into her scrubs when Mac came to find her. You look different, he remarked. Glowing. You're not knocked up, are you? No, definitely not, she rolled her eyes in amusement. What's going on today? It's like a ghost town. Virtually none of the regular staff had been present when she'd walked into the hospital. Max's smile faded. You haven't heard. Another massacre. Four women found in the grounds of the gasworks. All stabbed. They were brought to the Ur, but they were all DOA. Everyone is cleaning up that mess and or doing paperwork and or talking to police. Again. I'm so sick of police. Oh gosh, not again. Romy felt sick. She followed Mac out of the locker room as he headed for rounds. And get this, he went on. None of them knew each other. Police think they were all picked for some reason and then left together. One of them had her femur smashed like Yasmin Levant. Romy stopped. What did you say? Left femur smashed. Why? A curl of horror was beginning to form inside of her, a doubt, a horrific idea. Murders in New York and now Seattle, smashed femur, know you're being paranoid and ridiculous, sass. Can I see the records? Mac shrugged. Sure. They walked down to the ER, Romy assuring Mac she'd smooth things over with Blue if they were late for rounds. Romy picked up the files from the desk and read through them. There were multiple stab wounds, and all of the women were dark-haired and dark-eyed, with olive skin. Ha. Huh. She looked up at Mac, who was studying the files with an odd expression in his face. What? I just noticed. Their names. Roberta Ornella Margaret Inez. Their initials spell your name. 
Romy felt like she'd been hit in the chest by a sledgehammer. No, it had to be a coincidence. She turned to the computer and brought up the case files for Yasmin Levant and the other women who had died with her. Reading through the names, she looked at Mac, whose eyes were now troubled. Drawing in a deep breath, Romy logged on the internet and googled the murders in New York. Oh gosh! All of the victims had names whose initials spelled her first name. Mac put his hand on her shoulder. You know, Roms, this really could be coincidence. It isn't. Romy began to tremble. I need to talk to the police. Mac looked alarmed. You don't know who it is, do you? Romy nodded grimly. I do. I have to find Blue. Upstairs, Blue looked up, but his smile faded when he saw her face. He stood up and walked over to her immediately, reaching for her. What is it, sweetheart? Romy drew in a deep breath. It's Dacre. He's in Seattle. He's coming for me. Chapter 10 Artemis tried not to feel too excited as she made her way through the icy streets of Seattle to the coffee house. She and Dan had met up a few times, but this day was the first time when she was a free agent. Glenn had moved out over the weekend, and although they had both been sad, even cried a little, Artemis had never felt so convinced they were doing the right thing. And now she was going to see Dan, the man who had been haunting her dreams for weeks now. She'd repeatedly told herself it was just a friendship, but she couldn't mistake the look in Dan's eyes when he was with her, and she was sure it was reflected in hers. Desire. A bond. She had never felt so comfortable with a man in her life, so at ease and relaxed. At the same time, every time she was with him, all she wanted to do was rip his clothes off and kiss him until she couldn't breathe. She felt some guilt, after all she and Glenn had only just split, but then again, they'd lived separate lives for so many years. It was time to move on, and today was a big step forward doing just that. Today, Dan was bringing his teenage daughter to meet her. He had asked Artemis if she wouldn't mind, his face going red, and Artemis knew she was being assessed for… something. Gosh, she hoped she would pass the test, and it wasn't helping her nerves, but as soon as she pushed open the door to the coffee house, Dan and his female mini-me both grinned at her, and Artemis relaxed. Octavia was a delightful mix of typical teenager and nerdy geek. She reminded Artemis both of Juno with her confidence, and Romy in her dark looks. She told Octavia that, and the young woman smiled. Dad said the same thing. He's always talked about the sassy sass sisters, you're almost legendary in our house. Really? Artemis was absurdly flattered and Dan rolled his eyes. Way to ruin my game, kiddo. Octavia chuckled. Sorry, Pa, but it's the truth. I'd love to meet your sisters. We can arrange that, though Juno is leaving for New Orleans soon. Romy is still here, though, at the hospital. They chatted easily for an hour, then Octavia got up. She kissed Artemis's cheek. Sorry I have to cut and run, but I have study group. Her father coughed something which sounded suspiciously like geek. Octavia grinned. I am what you made me. Bye, Missy, I hope we see each other again soon. Pa, I'll probably stay over at Gail's tonight, so don't wait up. Just text me if you are. Will do. Bye. And she was gone. Artemis grinned at Dan. She's great. Dan grinned, delighted. I know, she's a good kid. I think you have her approval. Ha, I hope so. Artemis met his gaze and held it, blushing furiously, but Dan, his dark eyes twinkling, smiled in a way that made her stomach flutter. Missy? Yes? Her heart was beating out of her chest and she felt breathless. I'm gonna kiss you now. Dan leaned over and brushed her lips with his, lightly, before the kiss deepened and went on for a long moment. Artemis sank into his embrace, feeling his hands cup her face. Gosh, Missy, if you knew how long I've wanted to do that. Artemis smiled. Me too. What happens now? Well, option A, we stay here kissing all day. Option B. I take you back to my place, undress you slowly, and kiss your perfect skin, before we tender love. Dan Hellman, I say option B option A can go hang. 
Before she could finish her sentence, Dan had grabbed her hand and they were running towards his car. Afterwards they ordered pizza and ate it in bed, feeling like lovesick teens again. Artemis grinned at Dan's self-satisfied expression. Don't think for a minute, Hellman, that I left Glenn for you. Yeah, you did. But she could tell he was joking around and laughed. Admit it, woman, you had to have the Dan Dan man. Oh geez, I'm leaving, she groaned and giggled as he pulled her back into his arms and kissed her. Marinara kisses. Think I got some mozzarella action going on in my beard, if you're interested. His smile was so wide, Artemis couldn't help giggling until she cried. That's so gross. Your seduction game is poor, Helmand. You love it, Missy Sassy. She kissed him then. I do. You may be crazy, but I'm crazy about you. If I'm honest, I'm kind of relieving a high school fantasy right now. Dan grinned, smoothing her blonde hair back from her face. Except this is no fantasy. This is real, Missy. His face was serious now, but Artemis could see the love in his eyes. I'm all in, Missy. You and me, this is all I want. Artemis sighed happily, leaning into his embrace. Me too, big guy, me too. Stay with me tonight. She nodded, her lips suddenly too busy to speak, and they made love again, slowly this time, exploring each other's body, forgetting the time, long into the night. Romy sipped her now cold coffee. She had been with the police most of the day, and now she and Blue sat together in the interview room as the detective in charge of the homicides questioned her again. I'm sorry if I'm repeating questions, Dr. Sass, but it's important. Now, it could be a coincidence, but we always look for patterns, and we had noticed the women who died shared the same first name initial. But until you came forward, we didn't know who the message was intended for. Blue groaned in dismay, and the detective looked at him. Don't worry, Dr. Allende. We have a statewide bolo out for Dacre Mortimer. If he's here, we'll find him. In the meantime, we'll assign you protection, Dr. Sass. I can handle that. Blue said, his voice gruff. The best protection money can buy. He won't get near you, Romy. Gosh, was this really happening? Romy closed her eyes and asked herself if she was really that shocked. Dacre would never have accepted her leaving him, but to kill all these innocent victims to send her a message? Why didn't he just kill me? Her voice was quiet and surprisingly calm. Don't. Blue was barely holding on to his composure. The detective smiled at them. You've been unbelievably brave and helpful in coming forward. Go home and get some rest. I'll be in touch. Romy asked Blue to drive her to her mother's house. I want them all to know what's going on, it's not fair to them not to know that they might endanger too. Dacre is a monster. Her heart sank however, when they got to her mother's house. Gaius was there too, meeting with his father. Magda knew something was wrong, clearly, as she gazed at her middle daughter. Romy. Blue took Romy's hand. Magda, Dad, we have something to tell you. Two things. One we hope you'll be happy about, because we are. Romy and I have been seeing each other for a while now, and Magda, I'm so in love with your daughter. Magda exclaimed in delight and threw her arms around them. I thought I sensed something. Stuart grinned widely, clapping his son on the back. Son, I'm delighted for you both. Oh Romy, sweetheart, finally. I'm so happy you found a good man at long last. Magda was in tears, and Romy teared up a little too, before adding to the overall level of emotion. Mom, there's something else. Gaia, smirking in the background, leaned forward, his eyes glittering with spite. Don't be shy, sis, tell us. Romy flushed at the jibe, but she felt Blue squeeze her hand. Shut up, Gaius, this isn't the time for your malice. Magda, Dad, I'm afraid that it isn't all good news. We think Dacre Mortimer is in Seattle. Gosh, no. Magda went pale and clutched at her daughter's hand. Sit down with us, sweethearts, and tell us what's going on. As Romy told them about the murders, about the signature that had led her to suspect Dacre was behind them. I knew, or I should have known, he would come after me. He has nothing to lose by murdering me. His family has already cut him off, revenge is all he has left. 
Blue cleared his throat and Romy looked at him. His beautiful eyes were deeply troubled, and she could feel the tension in his body. Dad. I've already set the ball rolling for added protection. I know it's inconvenient, especially with the wedding coming up, but I won't risk any of us getting hurt. He paused, then glanced at his half-brother. Gaius, you too. And I think perhaps you'd better clue your mother in, too. That's very thoughtful of you. Gaius's voice was a monotone, and Romy couldn't tell whether he was being sincere or not. She studied him. The malice had gone from his eyes and he didn't smile. He looked at her. As long as you're okay, Romy, that's all I care about. His smirk was back. Romy looked away from him. Blue pressed his lips against her temple. Piccolo, I know this is fast but I'd feel a hell of a lot better if you moved in with me. I would too, Romy, her mother added quickly, and Romy nodded. Fine. Yes, of course. I'm sorry about this, everyone. Magda looked angry now. Listen here, my girl, you have nothing to be sorry about. He should have gone to jail when he hurt you last year. I could kill him with my bare hands. I will if he ever comes in spitting distance of me. Later, when Blue and Romy got back to his apartment, Blue made her drink some hot tea, Romy shivering uncontrollably. I thought it was all over, she said in a low voice, I was so stupid. No. Blue wrapped his arms around her, kissing her gently. There are crazy people all around. It has nothing to do with any choices you've made in life. I won't let anything happen to you. Romy leaned into him. It's weird. I'm scared but at the same time, I can't recall ever being as happy as I am with you right now. I love you, Blue. And I love you, baby. Maybe we should go away for a while. Romy shook her head. He'll just kill more people. If he knows I'm here, he can try and get to me and then we'll have him. Christ Romy you're not bait here. Blue's voice rose and then fell just as quickly. Sorry, I didn't mean to snap but we have to take this seriously. You saw what he did to Yasmin Levant. I did see, Romy said quietly. I watched her die, remember? Right alongside you. Blue blanched and yanked her heart into his chest. I'm sorry, baby. Forgive me, Piccolo. I didn't mean, I just, the thought of you in harm's way makes me insane. She curled into his warm, hard strength. I won't deliberately put myself in his sights, but once we confirm it is him. Maybe, just maybe I can help catch him. I need to do something, Blue. Those poor girls. Blue drew in a deep breath. For tonight, let's just try and forget him. This place is secure. Tomorrow, I'll call in a security team. Baby, do you feel safe? With you always. She kissed him and he stroked her face, half smiling. Regardless of the circumstances, I'm glad you're here. I was thinking about asking you to move in this morning, but then the sensible part of me said it might scare you off. Romy smiled at him. It might have done this morning, although I loved waking up with you. She sighed. I hate that the reason I'm here is because of him. No, Blue said, his lips brushing her, the reason you're here is that we love each other. You got that right, Doc. Romy pressed her body against his, and Blue held her tightly. Are you tired, Piccolo? Romy smiled. No, but I am starving. Blue laughed. Of course, forgive me. Well, how about some old-fashioned Italian comfort food? Pasta. Sold. Shall we order in? Blue pretended to look affronted. How dare you? Romy giggled. You can cook? Blue got up and pulled her to her feet, throwing her over his shoulder and carrying her to his state-of-the-art kitchen. Can I cook? I'm Italian, Piccolo. Sit here, he dumped her onto a stool and watched the maestro at work. Romy watched him cook pasta, rolling out the dough and making the ravioli with deft efficiency. He kept up a stream of instructions, just as he did in the operating theater, and when the pasta was cooked, Romy almost swooned at the garlicky, oozy, buttery taste. Gosh, Allende, she mumbled over a huge mouthful, is there anything you're not good at? He pretended to consider, then shrugged. Nope. He laughed as she threw her napkin at him. 
There's one thing you didn't think of, Dr. Wonderpants. I now have garlic breath. Ha, he said, so do I. He pressed his lips against hers, and they both decided that it wasn't an issue as the kiss deepened, and soon the remnants of the pasta were forgotten, as Blue tumbled her to the floor. For the next few hours, Blue did his best to make her forget everything else but the blissful release of making love, but as the night wore on and he fell asleep, Romy lay awake. Just as I find happiness, Dacre comes for me. Now that the fear had dissipated a little, she felt anger at the injustice of it. All those innocent girls. Romy eased out of Blue's arms and got out of bed, walking to the huge picture window that looked out over Seattle. Romy leaned her forehead against the cold glass and stared down at the streets below. Wherever you are, Dacre, come for me. I'm ready for you, you piece of shit. Come for me. I'm ready. Chapter 11 New Orleans Juno Sass sprawled on her friend's couch and watched as Livia balanced a plate of cookies on her huge pregnant belly. Juno grinned at her. I can't believe you're having a baby, Livy. When you think where you were a year ago. Livia Chatelaine smiled at her friend. You're not the only one who can't believe it, darling. When Sandor stabbed me, then put that bullet in me, I thought that was it. I was a goner. Still, that's in the past. She smoothed her dress over her bump. And this little girl is almost here. I cannot wait. Juno grinned. My first niece. You betcha. Speaking of which, you haven't filled me in on what your sisters are up to. Has Artie married Glenn yet? What about Romy? Does she like the hospital in Seattle? So many questions, Juno laughed. Okay, in order no they broke up, she's fine, and yes. Livia almost spat out her cookie. Glenn and Artie what? They split, Juno repeated. It wasn't a nasty breakup or anything, they'd just grown apart. Wow. So much for fairy tales, Livia muttered in dismay. Except mine. I won't deny I'm living the dream. Poor Artie, though. I think she's much happier, actually, Juno said. Now the real gossip is Romy. Talk about fairy tales. She's in love with our soon-to-be stepbrother Blue. Here. She grabbed Livia's iPad and typed something in, then showed Livia the photo of Blue Allende. Livia's eyes opened wide. Wow, he's gorgeous, and he and Romy? Or dating. They've only just told Mom and Stuart, but I knew a while back. Livia grinned at Juno's smug expression. They told you? No, I went for coffee with them unexpectedly and it was so obvious. Her smile faded after what Romy's ex did to her. Livia nodded, her eyes sad. And they think he's the one behind the murders? Yep, the thought of something happening to her again, she's so tiny Liv and she can kick ass believe me but Dacre is a sick person. Livia pushed herself from her chair, somewhat awkwardly, and came to hug her friend. Juno, you can't let it rule your life. I bet Romy is back at work today, saving lives. I remember when Sandor was waging his campaign, the thought of him hurting Knox or Odell. If Romy feels half the anger I did, she won't let Dacre near her or anyone she loves. Juno felt comforted by her friend's words, and when she was in bed later, in the sumptuous guest room of Knox and Livia's mansion, she called Romy, surprised when her sister picked up straight away. Well timed, Juno Boo. Romy sounded cheerful. I just got out of a four hour surgery and am on a break. How's Nola? How are Livy and gorgeous Knox? New Orleans is warm, Juno teased, hearing Romy's jealous groan. Livy is blooming, about to pop any second, and Knox is, well, delicious as always. You okay, Romulus? I am good, Romy said determinedly. No one is messing with me. You got seriously laid last night, didn't you? Juno laughed as her sister giggled. Last night, this morning, and as soon as Blue finishes up in about five minutes. The on-call room is free. Babe, you've turned into a nympho. Seriously, though, are you okay? I really, really am, Boo. Please don't worry. Juno heard voices in the background, and then the familiar voice of Blue. She heard her sister laugh. 
I guess you need to um get off the phone I mean. Romy laughed. You guessed right. You're okay though, right? I am. I really am. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. I love you. Love you too. Juno clicked off her phone and snuggled down in her bed. Romy sounded happy and not cowed by what was happening, and Juno had to be happy with that. She fell asleep and was woken three hours later by Livia shouting to Knox that the baby was coming. Seattle Dacre had seen Romy go into the on-call room with Blue Allende, and his gut had twisted with rage. He knew the police were looking for him, but they had old photos of him, photos before he'd shaved his head and grown a thick beard, adding piercings, a neck tattoo, and thick spectacles. He'd bulked up too. It made the killings easier if they couldn't match his physical strength. Gaius Eames had arranged the new identity so he could apply for the orderly job at Rainier Hope. Dacre still didn't trust the man, he wondered why he hated his half-brother so much when Gaius seemed to have unlimited resources. Maybe Gaius wanted Romy too, and if so, Dacre wouldn't stand for that. Romy was his. She hadn't even recognized him the time she'd asked him direct questions, she was friendly and polite, joking around with the patients and with him. He changed his voice too, whiskey and cigarettes lowering his register. No one, not even his damn parents, would recognize Dacre Mortimer, preppy Harvard grad now. Gaius Eames had asked of him one favor. Don't kill your ex-wife yet, he'd said. I want Blue to really fall for her, so when she dies, he'll be destroyed. Dacre gritted his teeth. The thought of his hands on her. Gaius had smiled. Think of the ways you could punish her, Mortimer. Those girls you killed had it easy compared to what you're going to do to the lovely Romy. Dacre had liked the sound of that, so he'd agreed. Working at the hospital was another one of Gaius's ideas, as was the small studio apartment close to the hospital. Now, as he heard the door of the on-call room click closed, he knew that Allende had his hands all over his Romy and it made him rage. Dacre checked his watch, his shift was over in five minutes. He paused, entertaining the fantasy of storming into the on-call room and butchering his ex-wife and her lover. Instead, he finished up his shift and left the hospital. His body tingled with rage and the need to kill. Gaius had told him his little game of killing women with Romy's initials had been found out. Good, it meant she was scared. Dacre went home, ate a sparse meal of microwave hot dogs, and sucked down a couple of beers. He watched TV mindlessly for a few hours, then, just after midnight, headed out into the city. He was careful always to wear black so that the blood of his victims would not show up on his clothes, and when he returned home, he would seal those clothes into a sack and burn them in the furnace at work. Tonight, he looked for anyone who resembled Romy. He found her working at a bar downtown, followed her when she closed up for the night, took her at the end of an alleyway, and dragged her into the darkness. She was beautiful, with long dark wavy hair, doe-eyed, petite. He overpowered her easily, and as the knife sank deep into her flesh, Dacre felt the usual release. Staring at the girl unseeing, all he thought of was how it would feel to kill Romy like this, his blade slicing through her tender flesh, severing arteries, destroying her vital organs. This girl died too quickly, his knife cutting through her abdominal aorta clumsily, though he usually liked to draw it out. He lowered her to the ground as she struggled for life, ripping her shirt open and finishing her with a few brutal stabs. The girl, her eyes wide with terror and agony, made a gurgling sound as blood filled her throat, then went still. Dacre stood, breathing heavily, staring down at her, only seeing Romy's face on this girl's brutalized body. Dacre sucked in lungfuls of air, smelling the rust and salt smell of his victim's blood, then leaving her for others to find, walked slowly back home and feel into a deep peaceful sleep. Chapter 12 Stuart Eames looked up as his soon-to-be ex-wife approached the table. He stood, dutifully kissing her on the cheek, and pulled out her chair for her. Hilary Eames smiled and sat down. Always the gentleman. Stuart tried not to roll his eyes. Hilary was obviously in one of her seductive moods. You look well, Hilary. She smiled. You too. Magda Sass is obviously looking after you, 
and I hear her daughter is looking after the Italian too. Stuart sighed. His name is Blue, as you well know, Hillary, and yes, he and Romy are seeing each other. Keeping it in the family. He grimaced in disgust. I didn't come here to talk about Blue's love life, Hillary. We agreed to meet to finalize the divorce, so shall we stick to that topic? Hillary smirked. Stuart studied her. Hillary had once been considered a beautiful woman, but now she was stick-thin, gaunt, brittle. Her dark hair, once her crowning glory, was now coiffed to hide the hairpieces she used to create the illusion of lustrousness, her blue eyes ringed with coal hard lines. Her full lips, enhanced by fillers, made her look slightly ridiculous. Her cheekbones were jutting out, and even the amount of makeup she wore couldn't conceal the grayness of her skin, the pinched look from denying herself food. Being rich and thin was the overriding reason Hillary lived, that and to cause misery to those she felt envious of. Stuart wondered how he could ever have loved this woman, she was Magda's antithesis. So, you dropping your claim to the financial settlement has me wondering, what are you up to, Hillary? Hillary hid a smile behind her water glass. I thought you'd be happy. Who is he? I know there must be a he because otherwise there isn't a chance in hell you'd relinquish my money unless you had someone else lined up. You think so little of me. Stuart stayed silent rather than lie. Hillary shrugged. Not that it's any of your business, Stuart, but Giles is. Giles? Suddenly Stuart started to laugh. You mean Giles Street Clement? Lord Giles Street Clement? Oh, Hilly, you really are so transparent. Hillary's face contorted in anger. If you must know, Giles and I are in love, and as soon as the divorce comes through, we are to be married. And you're moving to London? I can see it now. High tea with the Prime Minister as you peddle your faux humanitarian causes. Blow jobs abound and suddenly, Lady Street Clement, you're receiving titles of your own. Honorary damehoods, perhaps? Stuart hadn't meant to be so cutting, it wasn't his style, and this meeting was after all, to make sure Hillary did sign the divorce papers, and now he realized he had gone too far. Hillary's eyes glittered with spite. What's it to you who I marry or who I blow, as you so crudely put it? This is what I want, Stuart, just like your pathetic little hippie is who you want. Aren't you glad I'll be out of your life for good? Stuart shrugged. Sure. I just hope Giles knows what he's let himself in for. F you, Stuart. I never loved you, I was stupid to think I did. Stuart's smile faded. You think I don't know that? And you made Bianca's life a misery, too. She spawned your precious love child the saint like blue. If you only knew, Stuart, about your son. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Stuart was irked now, but Hillary just smiled. You have two sons, Stuart. Isn't it about time you concentrated on your firstborn? Gaius tells me he feels shut out of your new family. That's not even close to true, Hillary. Gaius just tells you what you want to hear, because it suits him to feel like the red-headed stepchild. Magda has made great efforts to include him. Far more efforts than you made with Blue. You're just surrounded by saint-like people, aren't you? Stuart gritted his teeth. This was more like the Hillary he knew, spiteful, resentful, vindictive. I really think we should stick to signing these papers. Do you want lunch, Hillary? She shook her head, dismissive. I don't have time. She took the papers from him and scrawled her signature where he indicated. Stuart put the signed papers back in his jacket pocket. Thank you. I wish you well, Hillary. Hillary smiled at him, and for a brief second, Stuart could see the beautiful woman she had once been. Then the malice crept back in her face. Tell your girlfriend's daughter to watch out for Blue, he isn't what he says he is. Hillary's last words were still bugging Stuart as he drove back to Magda's home. They had decided that he would move in with her after the wedding, selling his massive condo. I don't need it, he told her, this is home to me now. Magda saw the preoccupation on his face, and Stuart told her what Hillary had said. Magda shrugged it off. She's just trying to upset you. Blue is a good man, we all know that. Stuart sighed. I know. I just don't trust Hillary not to go mess things up for him. 
She loathed Bianca and barely even spoke to Blue, until get this, until he was a young teenager and started to blossom into his looks. Then she would show him off like a trophy. Blue isn't like Gaius. He hated being paraded around like a prize. As soon as he was 18, he left home just to get away from her. I confess, I helped him move out. He sat and rubbed his face but then smiled at Magda. But all that aside, she signed the papers. Magda grinned and sat down on his knees. You're a free man? I'm a free man, so officially Magdalena Helen Sass, would you do me the great honor of marrying me? Magda laughed and nodded. I will, Stuart Gregory Eames. I really will, and if you'll have me on Christmas Day. Stuart grinned, knowing the arrangements were almost in place for their wedding. He kissed her tenderly, gazing up into her navy blue eyes. I can't wait, my darling. I can't wait. Romy was concentrating so hard on the practice dummy she was performing a surgery on that she didn't see Mac sidle into the room until he poked her side and made her jump. Dude. You just killed my patient. Mac laughed. Nah, she was a goner anyway. So. Romy hid a grin. Yes? You and Doc Iende? Romy flushed but smiled. Pretty much. How long? A couple of months. Rom? She looked up to see his smile. Is it love? She nodded, flushing again. It is. I'm crazy about him. Good. You get your man, girl. It's not like it's a huge surprise to anyone. Romy looked at him sharply. What? Mac held his hands up. Slow your roll. I didn't tell anyone. But the chemistry between the two of you speaks for itself. He watched her for a few minutes as she worked. Rom? Did you hear? More murders. Romy's hand slipped and she cussed, ripping off her gloves to see the small gash in the top of her finger. Mac helped her to clean it up. Girl, why were you wearing gloves to operate on a dummy? Habit, she said, ouch. Sorry. Look, it just needs cleaning and a stitch is all. No biggie. Want me to do it? Please. Mac studied her face as he helped her. I know you think these killings are your fault. They're not, babe. They are the work of a very sick, very bad man. Do you know how many times I thank God that he didn't kill you that day? And I didn't even know you back then. You're a survivor, Romy. But what does that mean when innocent women are being killed because of me? It's not because of you. Max said angrily. Gosh, I could kill Dacre Mortimer with my bare hands. Have the police told you anything about their search? Romy shook her head. He could be anywhere, Mac. Except here. We have his picture up at every entrance, all the security team has been advised to look out, all the reception staff. I know, and I'm grateful. Thanks, Mac. He finished treating her finger. You deserve happy, Romy. We can all see that you and Blue make each other happy. Live that, not the past. Romy hugged her friend. Thanks, Mac. Romy went to find Blue afterward, eager to see him and kiss him, but as she approached his office door, she could hear him arguing. No, no way. I do not want to see you or talk to you. Why can't you get that into your head? Romy stopped, listening, but she couldn't hear anyone replying. It must be a phone call. Feeling guilty, she hovered just outside the door. She heard him sigh. Look, I don't know why you're bringing this up now. Perhaps you heard I'm in love with someone else. I thought so. Keep your less than subtle threats to yourself. She heard him slam the phone down and mutter to himself. Romy waited a beat then knocked at his door. Blue looked up and for a second his face was stormy, dark, beautiful, and terrifying. When he realized who it was, the storm cleared and he grinned at her. Why are you knocking, baby? Come here. Romy went into his arms and he kissed her tenderly, his eyes never leaving hers. Gosh, I love you, woman. Romy chuckled. Right back at you. I just came to see the schedule of surgeries, and to kiss your face off, of course. Of course. He pulled her onto his lap and reached for the schedule. 
light today unless we get any emergencies. He stroked her hair back from her face. After the lap, you could duck out and go Christmas shopping if you want. I'll cover. Nah. That's what Amazon.com is for. Romy leaned her cheek against his and closed her eyes. She was so curious as to who he had been talking to, but couldn't bring herself to ask. I did some serious shopping at lunch. Speaking of which, I have no idea what to get you. All I need is you, baby. Blue kissed her. If I have you, I have everything. Romy grinned. Mushy. Okay, so I'll ask your dad. Like he'll know. Honestly, Romy, I don't need anything. He twirled a lock of her hair around his finger. How about this? Instead of exchanging gifts, we go away together after Christmas. Romy smiled. Is this you trying to get me out of Seattle again? A little, Blue admitted with a wry smile. But also, I keep dreaming of us in a rustic Italian villa, making love in the olive groves. My fantasy is you in a summer dress, no clothes. Romy turned on groaned. Gosh blue. Laughing and talking, they tidied themselves up and went back to work. The routine laparotomy went easily, and afterwards, Blue took Romy out to dinner. Romy didn't know when she started to feel uneasy, but in the car on the way home, she kept looking behind them as if she had seen something. Blue frowned at her. You okay, baby? Romy nodded, but her chest was tight. I don't know why, but I feel like someone was watching us. In my office? She shook her head. No, at the restaurant. I went to the bathroom and I could have sworn, no, never mind. I'm just being paranoid. She glanced behind them again. Blue looked in the rearview mirror. Sweetheart, if your instincts are telling you something, we should listen to them. Do you think we're being followed? Romy didn't want to sound insane, but Blue's expression was serious. It's crazy, but yes. There's a dark sedan that's been following us all the way from the restaurant. Gotcha. With deafness and skill, Blue pulled the car off the freeway and onto a side street. He made a circuit of the almost deserted business district, and then circled back towards his apartment. How about now? Romy was watching carefully. I can't see it anymore. I'm sorry, honey, maybe I was imagining it. Better safe than not. She smiled gratefully at him. I promise I'm not a hysterical female. Blue laughed. Would never have crossed my mind that you were. As they parked the car in the garage beneath his building, Romy couldn't resist checking out the other cars there. Blue grinned at her. Still being super spy. You got me. He took her hand. Come on, Black Widow, let's go home and cuddle some. In the elevator, alone, he kissed her tenderly. You know, if you want, we could look for somewhere together. We don't have to stay here. I love your apartment, she said, leaning into him, feeling his arms tightening around her. He was still laughing when he unlocked the door to his apartment and held it for her. After you, ma'am. Romy's laughter echoed through the hallway, but when she got into the living room, her smile faded. She heard Blue cuss behind her. What the heck? The dark-haired woman with a smile on her face said. Hello, darling Blue. Is this your new toy? Would she like to play with us? Romy's whole body was icy cold. She slowly turned to Blue. I take it back. I hate your apartment. She pushed past him, wrenching her arm free when he grabbed it. No baby, wait, this isn't what it. But Romy ran, slamming the door behind her, her sobs racking and desiccating. Hilary Eames stood up and sashayed over to her stepson. Flighty, isn't she? Blue, his anger threatening to overwhelm him, lowered at her. What the heck do you think you're doing, Hilary? She touched his cheek and he flinched away. She smiled. Just reclaiming what is mine, Blue. Get out. Blue clenched his fists to stop himself from physically hauling her out of his apartment. Now, Hillary, and don't ever come back. Hillary pretended to pout. Come on. Don't you remember the fun we used to have? Gosh, you were like a Roman god back then. She studied him. Now, you look tired, Blue. 
She's exhausting you, making you pretend that you're good enough for her when you and I know differently, don't we? Get out now, Hillary, or I won't be responsible for what I'll do. Hillary smirked. Fine. I'll go. You know where to call me. Don't hold your breath. You know what you did to me. Don't pretend it was anything more than. Blue squeezed his eyes shut, trying to erase the memories, the feelings from back when he was just a kid. Call it what you will, Blue. Blue did lose his temper then, and taking her by the upper arm hauled Hillary to the door and threw her out. A bright flash blinded him, and he realized that a paparazzo had been waiting outside his door to take a photo of him throwing a naked and grinning Hillary from his home. But Romy was all he could think about, out there unprotected. Blue called the security firm. Find her. Protect her. She won't want to see me at the moment, and that's fine. But please keep her safe. We'll do, boss. Chapter 13 Running out into the midnight streets, Romy kept going until she could not breathe any longer. Stopping, dragging much-needed oxygen into her lungs, she allowed herself to feel the pain of what had just happened in and it bent her double. Slowly, as her breathing returned to normal, she began to walk, dazed. She knew it wasn't safe to do this, but at this moment, the pain of Blue's betrayal seemed to overwhelm any fear that Dacre might catch up with her. Come for me now, Dacre, and end this pain for me. I don't care anymore. She sat down on a low wall and put her head in her hands, willing the tears to stop. Gosh, how stupid was I? To think a man like Blue wouldn't have a fleet of women in his past. How long ago had he slept with this one? Who was she? She was beautiful, if skinny as hell, but way too old for him. Geez, that's what you're focusing on, Sass? Romy wiped her eyes. She'd call a cab and get them to pick her up at the end of the street. She was dialing when a silver Audi pulled up beside her. She began to walk quicker, nervous now. Romy. She stopped, turning towards the speaker. Gaius smiled at her. What on earth are you doing out here so late? I... Romy didn't know what to say. Blue was called in for an emergency and I decided to try and find a cab. Lame as hell. Girl, get in. With your rabid ex on the loose, you really do not need to be out on the streets alone. I'm fine. Her voice shook, betraying her. Gaius got out and came to her. Come on, sweetheart. I'll take you home. Romy let him put her in his passenger seat and drive away from Blue's neighborhood. Gaius looked over at her, concerned. Are you okay? Romy nodded. Would you mind taking me to my sister's place? To Artemis's place. She gave him the address and then smiled tentatively at him. Thanks, Gaius. It's no problem, but are you sure you're okay? You look upset. I'm fine. You said that already. Romy gave a half-hearted laugh. Just tired. She stared out of the car window. The shock was dissipating now, and Romy was beginning to regret running away. She should have stood her ground and gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the skank in Blue's flat. Romy gritted her teeth. Then again, why the hell hadn't Blue come after her? Was it the guilt of being caught? Gosh. Romy closed her eyes. The pain in her chest was killing her. Had she gotten him so wrong? No. She was sure of Blue's love for her, utterly sure. There had to be some kind of rational explanation for it. Gaius left her alone on the journey, only turning to her as they turned into Artemis's street. Are you sure I can't do anything else for you, Romy? No, thank you again, Gaius. A thought occurred to her. What were you doing in Blue's neighborhood tonight? Just hoping to see my brother for a few minutes. Nothing important. That didn't ring true, but Romy didn't have the energy to press the point. She got out, then bent down to thank him again. Gaius smiled at her. It's no problem. If you need anything, I'm always here for you, Romy. Always. She watched him drive away, then dug in her purse for the key. All of the sisters had keys to each other's houses, and Romy was glad she wouldn't have to wake Artie up. 
She snuck into the house, but halfway up the stairs her phone beeped. She knew it had to be blue. Baby, where are you? I swear it wasn't how it looked, but of course I would say that. Please believe me, her being here was nothing to do with us. Please just let me know you're safe. I love you. Romy sighed, all her anger dissipated. We'll talk tomorrow, Blue. That's all I can promise right now. I'm at Artie's for the night. I'm safe. Of course. Just know I love you. I love you too. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Romy climbed up the stairs wearily and slipped into Artie's guest bedroom. She stripped down to her underwear and into bed, only to encounter bare flesh. She shrieked, as did the other person in the bed, and Romy skittered across the room to switch the light on. A young woman with dark hair and huge brown eyes was staring at her, her hand clamped over her mouth. Who are you? Romy asked, breathless, but the girl didn't have time to answer before Artemis burst into the room, followed by a giant of a man who looked familiar. Romy gaped at him. Dan. Dan Helmond. The man grinned widely, a strange counterpoint to the three women all in shock. Romy sass as I live and breathe. I take it you've met my daughter, and your mini-me, Octavia. Tavia, meet Romy Sass, Artemis's sister. Romy and her younger double stared at each other for a long moment before Romy, not knowing what else to do, burst out laughing. Chapter 14 Romy shrugged, recounting the story to her sister. So I just walked out. Wouldn't you? Artemis, sitting opposite her sister at the breakfast bar, chewed on her toast thoughtfully. Maybe. No, probably not. You know me, I would have demanded a full and detailed explanation. With color coding. Artemis grinned as Dan and Octavia laughed. And you, sis, are the firebrand, so I guess I can't blame you for walking away. Romy sighed. I told Blue I'd meet him this morning in the city. Don't suppose you could give me a ride? I can. Octavia said, spooning the last of her cereal into her mouth, I have to go to the library, it's no problem. Romy grinned at her. Thanks, dude. I still can't get over how alike we look. Daniel, are you sure you didn't fool around with my mom when we were back in high school? The women laughed as Dan held up his hands. All I'm saying is Magda is a beautiful woman. Dad. Gosh, you're so embarrassing. Octavia hid her face in her hands as her father smirked. Romy snorted with laughter and poked Octavia. Come on then, twinsie, let's get going. On the drive into the city, Romy and Octavia chatted easily, then Octavia smiled at her. Artemis told me you are actually a twin. I'm sorry about your brother. Romy felt a lump in her throat. Thanks. I miss him still, even though it's been over twenty years. What happened? If you don't mind telling me. Romy cleared her throat. Not at all. Her voice quivered a little, but she ignored it. It was so quick, such a normal moment in a normal day. He fell over in the schoolyard. He was playing with some friends and tripped and hit his head. For a few hours he was okay, and then the next morning, Mom found him dead in bed from a hemorrhage. Even now, Romy remembered the agony of seeing her twin, the person closest to her, blue-lipped and lifeless. Octavia had tears in her eyes. I'm so sorry, Romy. You know what it's like to lose someone, Tavia. It never gets easier, you just get used to the pain. Octavia nodded. I know. Mom fought cancer twice, once before she had me. That time she won, and was determined that it wouldn't stop her and dad from having kids. They went through seven rounds of IVF before one took. Sometimes I wonder if having me, putting her body through all of that, made her weaker and allowed the cancer back in. Romy squeezed her hand. No honey, it doesn't work like that. And believe me, she would have taken the cancer over and over again if it meant having you in her life. Octavia looked tearful. Thank you, Romy. She laughed a little through her tears. I wish you were my sister. How about we pretend we are? After all, it looks like Artie and your dad are pretty much solid, 
so that makes you family. Of course, I would technically be your step-aunt, but sister sounds better, right? Octavia grinned at Romy. Deal. Octavia dropped Romy off at the breakfast place and waved goodbye. Romy drew in a deep lungful of oxygen and went inside, seeing Blue was already waiting for her. His green eyes were troubled, wary, but Romy allowed him to pull her into a hug. Thank you for coming, baby. Romy leaned into him, breathing in his woodsy clean scent. Let's talk. They ordered eggs and toast with strong black coffee and Romy waited. Blue looked at her. I have no idea how she got into my apartment, but I swear to you, Romy, I'm not sleeping with her. Who is she? Blue hesitated. An ex-patient who got a little too close. Did you sleep with her before you knew me? Romy was watching his expression carefully. Don't lie, please don't lie. Again, Blue paused. It's more complicated than that. His answer irked Romy. Either you've slept with her or not, Blue. His expression was unreadable, then in a low voice. Technically, I did have intercourse with her. What does that mean? Romy. I have a past, and some things are too painful, too scarring to discuss. You should know that. Ouch. Don't try and weasel out of this by bringing up Dacre Blue. I'm not trying to weasel out of anything. It is what it is. Romy sighed. She wanted to believe Blue, but there was something in her gut instinct making it difficult. But you're no longer involved with her? No, nor any other woman. Believe me, Romy, you are my love, my life. He leaned forward and brushed her lips with his. She didn't pull away. Nothing will ever change that. As far as I'm concerned, you and me. We're endgame. Romy felt a rush of warmth inside her at his words. We are? Yes? This time his words were defiant, determined. Blue held her gaze steadily. I love you. Romy half smiled. I love you too, Doc. Can we move past this? She considered for a long moment, then nodded. I guess we can. But no more beautiful naked women in the apartment. Blue grinned. Unless it's you. Romy laughed then, her tension falling away. Unless it's me. And get your locks changed, would you? If she could get in that easily, anyone could. Already done, he said grimly, and the building's security team got a tongue lashing as well. Maybe we should look for somewhere together. Blue nodded. I'd like that. I want to be somewhere of both our choosing. Romy was dreaming now. Maybe out on one of the islands? I. Her attention was suddenly caught by the flat screen TV in the corner of the diner. Blue's face flashed up, followed by a photograph of the naked woman being thrown out of his apartment and Blue's shocked, angry face behind her. With a sledgehammer-like shock to her heart, Romy read the headline. Prominent Seattle surgeon in late-night tryst with naked stepmother, socialite Hillary Eames. Photographer captures moment lover's tiff escalates into public humiliation. Romy felt her throat fill with vomit. Oh my gosh. She breathed and turned on a shocked Blue. An ex-patient, huh? You sick pervert. Blue, your own stepmother? It wasn't like that, I swear. Blue's voice was gravelly, broken, his shoulders slumped, but Romy had no sympathy. How could you? She didn't wait for an answer, but darted to the bathrooms and threw up and up, until she was sobbing and dry heaving. She sat on the bathroom floor and cried, her heart shattering. What the heck is wrong with the world? A young waitress came to find her. Are you okay? Romy shook her head. No. Your friend asked me to come see if you were okay. The waitress crouched down beside her, her kind face concerned. Romy tried to smile. He's no friend of mine. She wiped her face. Is there a back way out of this place? The waitress led Romy through the kitchens and Romy thanked her, pressing a large tip into her hands. Give me a few moments before you tell him I'm gone, would you? Of course. I hope you're okay. Thanks, honey. Romy went out into the cold December streets and walked to work. How the hell were they going to resolve this? Everything was so messed up. 
You should never have slept with him to begin with. Would she have to transfer to a different hospital? Gosh. She was in the locker room when Mac came and hugged her. You okay? I saw the crap on the news. No, I'm not okay, but I have to work, so here I am. She lowered her voice. Is he here? Have you seen him? Mac nodded, glancing around at the other residents. He looks broken, Romy. Utterly devastated. I saw him talking to Quinto. You defending him? No way. Team Romy all the way. I'm just saying, he's not out there preening. Romy felt a little better, and a little worse at that. She almost wanted Blue to be unrepentant so she could keep being mad at him. He was sleeping with his stepmother, she told herself, you have plenty to be mad about. A few minutes later, just as they were leaving for rounds, the chief of surgery, Bo Kinto, came to find them. Okay people, so a bit of news. Dr. Allende has requested and been granted some personal time. Therefore, I'll be your lead for the time being. Sass and Jones, if you could still keep to the general surgical schedule you had planned, I'll be stepping in to replace Dr. Allende. Quinto's eyes flicked to Romy's face briefly and she couldn't read the expression. Was he mad at her? She bristled then told herself to calm down. The man was a professional, and she hadn't done anything wrong. Quinto gave out his orders to the rest of the residents, and they all scattered throughout the hospital. Romy was relieved that she had some breathing space. Mac nudged her as they walked down the ORs. Wonder how long Allende will be away. She shrugged. Until he gets his life sorted out. Does that include you? Romy didn't know how to answer him. Chapter 15 Christmas Eve, and Romy finished late in the evening, wanting to catch up with her files before she took some time away for her mother's wedding. If she was honest, she was delaying going home. Going home meant facing Blue for the first time since the Hillary incident, but there was no way out of it. In the morning, her mother would marry Stuart, and there was no way either she or Blue would let their parents down. Maybe we should just shake hands and live as step-siblings, she thought now. The thought depressed her, though, and she suddenly felt tearful. Distraction is what I need. She walked through the floor, checking on all her post-surgical patients, chatting to the few who were still awake, wishing them a Merry Christmas even if it was spent away from their families. The hospital always made sure that, if at all possible, they could have an enjoyable time. There was one patient who wouldn't even know it was Christmas. Kelly Young, a young woman who had been in a car accident a few weeks previously, lay in a coma. No family, no visitors, and so Romy had taken to sitting with her, holding her hand, and talking to her, trying to reach into the young woman's locked in mind. Hey Kells, Romy said now, pulling a chair up to the side of her bed. How you doing, kiddo? She checked Kelly's vital signs, flicked her light in the girl's eyes, then sat down. Merry Christmas, sweetheart. Wish you were awake to share it, but I promise when you do wake up, I'll make sure you have your Christmas. She sat with Kelly nearly an hour, almost falling asleep, when she heard someone at the doorway. How is she? Romy turned to see one of the orderlies, a huge hulking man, nodding at Kelly. He was bald-headed with a thick dark beard, multiple piercings and thick spectacles, but his smile was friendly. Romy racked her brain for his name. Wally? Warren? The same, she replied, looking back at Kelly, although I live in hope she'll wake up. Fingers crossed. Sorry to bother you, Doc, but we just needed to check in, see if you needed us any more tonight. Romy smiled at him. No thanks. Warren. Have a good Christmas. You too, Doc. Thanks. Left alone again, Romy squeezed Kelly's hand. Do me a favor, kiddo. Give me the best Christmas gift by waking up, huh? Sweet dreams, sweetheart. The hospital was so quiet, so still, that as Romy walked through the reception area out to the parking lot, her heels echoed on the polished floor. Outside, the temperature was dropping fast and thick, fluffy snow falling from the sky. A picture-perfect Christmas for us, Romy thought, pulling out of the lot and turning the car towards her mother's house. The roads were almost empty as the snow began to thicken, and Romy drove with extra care, 
her heart thumping painfully all the way home. When she got home, she only saw one light on, Artemis' old room. Breathing a sigh of relief that everyone else seemed to be in bed, she snuck through the house to her old room. Juno, back from New Orleans, was curled up in one side of the bed, fast asleep. Romy pulled her wet boots and jeans off, changing into her fluffy brushed cotton jammies and pulling her robe around her. Despite the time, she wasn't tired, and so, instead of waking Juno up with her restlessness, Romy tugged a comforter from the closet and went back downstairs. The living room had been transformed into a winter wonderland by her mother. Thousands of tiny white lights, white ribbons, and tasteful Christmas decorations everywhere. It really is going to be a fairy tale wedding, Romy thought, with a pang of both sadness and joy. Her mother deserved every happiness, and now Romy nodded to herself. She would not let this thing with Blue ruin her mom's day. She would tell him they could talk, after the wedding. In the meantime, they would plaster smiles on their faces and be a family. Afterward, they gazed at each other. I hate how much I love you, she said, and he nodded. I promise, Romy, I will make this right between us. We need to talk. I know, Romy closed her eyes as he kissed her. But after the wedding. Agreed. I love you, Romy, he said, his voice trembling with emotion. I've never loved anyone or anything as much as I love you, beautiful girl. Please don't ever leave me. Romy was moved beyond words and hot tears dripped from her eyes, splashing on her naked body. Blue stroked her face, wiped away her tears. I promise, I'll tell you everything. Everything. There will be no more secrets between us. The more important thing was that Blue was destroyed. Gaius gritted his teeth. When he had seen that photograph of Blue throwing Gaius' naked mother out of his apartment, the rage had been like nothing he'd ever known. Gaius had been so mad that he had ignored his mother's phone calls, staying silent as she'd begged outside his door. How could you, Mom? With the man I have hated all my life. Gaius watched now as Blue swept Romy into his arms and gritted his teeth. You took the woman I loved, brother, and now I'm going to do the same to you. Romy is a dead woman, Blue, and you know what? It's entirely your fault. Chapter 16 Romy woke feeling more at peace than she'd expected to. Blue's arms were around her and she stayed locked in them as she gazed up at him. Yes, she loved this man. Whatever he had done in the past was the past. He'd said he would tell her everything, and she believed him. Romy was amazed at herself. After Dacre, she had struggled with trust, and yet here she was risking her heart once again for this man. As they dressed for the wedding later, Romy smiled at him. Damn man, you wear a suit well. He was wearing a dark gray, exquisitely tailored suit, which brought out the green of his eyes. He was grinning at her. Woman, you should see what I'm seeing. The dark old shift dress clung to her curves, simple in its design but perfectly matched to her olive skin tone. The lightest makeup and her dark hair falling in waves down her back completed her bridesmaid look. Blue couldn't keep his hands off of her, kissing her tenderly. She stroked his face. Blue, today is all about Mom and Stuart. That's all I care about today, so let's put everything else aside for after they've left for their honeymoon. I agree, but can I just say one thing? Go for it. I love you, Romy Sass, and there are things in my past I'm ashamed of, but nothing, nothing means more to me than earning and deserving your love and your trust. Downstairs, Artemis was arranging everything and everyone, and Romy saw that some of the guests had started to arrive. She welcomed them in and made sure they had drinks before heading up to see how Magda was doing. Her mother was uncharacteristically calm. Hello, darling. Could you help me with this hair comb? Magda was dressed in a simple pale cream dress too, with only some ornate beading around the neck and sleeves. The hair comb was encrusted with rubies, a present from Romy's grandmother when Magda had graduated from college. You look breathtaking, Mom. Romy hugged her gingerly and Magda beamed. She studied her daughter. You look happier, darling. Did you and Blue talk? Romy half smiled. A little. But today isn't about us, it's about you and Stuart. As the reckless middle daughter, I think it's probably up to me to ask the awkward question. 
Are you sure, Mom? Her mother met her gaze steadily. I am, Romy. I truly am. Romy smiled. Then I wish you nothing but utter happiness and joy forever. I love Stuart, he really is a good man. Oh, here. Dad sent a message too. He did. Magda read the card James Sass had sent. That's sweet. Your daddy is a good man, Romy. In spite of everything. I know, Mom. And now I have a stepdad, too. Magda laughed. Not quite yet. She glanced at her clock. Wow, that came around quickly. Forty-five minutes, and then the nerve-wracking stuff will be over with and we can party. A half hour later, Romy walked her mother down the wooden staircase and to the front of the aisle, Artemis serving as matron of honor, and a grinning Juno, resplendent in a man's tuxedo, welcoming the guests to the wedding. Blue and Gaius stood at Stuart's side as he married Magda, Blue's eyes twinkling with happiness as he winked at Romy. Gosh, I love you, she thought as she smiled back and felt the weight of the last few weeks fall away from her. This was all that mattered, love, family, celebration. As Magda and Stuart said their vows, she wondered idly if she and Blue would ever get here. She didn't even know if he regarded marriage as a goal. Romy never had, until she'd met Blue. Her mother looked so overwhelmingly happy that as Juno declared them husband and wife, Romy burst into tears, making everyone laugh. The reception was a laid-back affair of chatting, casual speeches which made everyone laugh, soft music and a buffet of such delicious food that it was soon gone and the caterers were thanked and sent on their way. Blue sat with Romy on his lap in one of the armchairs. Juno sprawled on the sofa, one of their guest's toddler asleep in her arms. Artemis, Dan, and Octavia sat on the carpet, teasing each other. Romy watched her mother circulate the room, taking time to chat with every guest, introducing them to her new husband. Blue grinned at Romy. Some of Dad's friends are maybe a little too? Snooty. Blue laughed. I was going to say reserved, but snooty works. They can't figure out what they're supposed to do in such a relaxed gathering. Romy shrugged and snuggled into his arms. Blue pressed his lips to her forehead. Romy. Yes, baby. Will you come to Italy with me for New Year's? Romy looked up at him. Blue, we need to resolve things between us first. I know, I'm just saying, we'll talk today, tomorrow, maybe the next day. It's going to be hard for me to talk about some of this stuff. So I just thought if, and I mean if no pressure, if we can reach a resolution, let's have a few days of us away from all of this. Romy kissed his neck. How soon do I have to confirm? A couple of days. She nodded. Then, once Stuart and Mom leave for honeymoon, let's go back to your apartment and lock ourselves in and get through this. I want to go with you, baby, I really do, but not until everything is out in the open. That's fair. He pressed his lips to hers. I love you. Magda hugged her daughters, tears flooding down her face. I love you, Ardi Romulus and Juno Boo. So much. Thank you for making my day so perfect, so beautiful. Stuart himself moved deeply, also embraced them. I will never replace your dad but just know, to me, you are already my daughters, and I think myself the luckiest man on earth. Even the stoic Artemis was crying as they waved them off. Gosh, Barbados for a month, groaned a jealous Juno. Octavia giggled with her, the two of them already fast friends. Come on, people, let's ignore the tidying up and go drink the contents of Mom's liquor cabinet. Romy and Blue excused themselves and drove through the cold night back to the city, making it to Blue's apartment just after midnight. Blue opened the door for her, and Romy couldn't help but brace herself for another unwanted intrusion. This time, though, they were totally alone. They sat down at his kitchen table, Blue finding a bottle of scotch and some glasses, and pouring a finger of the dark tan liquid into each. So, he began, and Romy took his hand. So. Blue breathed in a deep lungful of oxygen. Hillary Eames. Hillary Eames is a vindictive, manipulative piece of human excrement. We all know that. That's not all she is. She. His voice broke and he looked away from Romy's gaze. She likes young men, Romy. Very young men. 
It took Romy a second to catch on, and her heart sank. Oh gosh. Yep. After mom died, after I came to live with Stuart, at first, she wouldn't even look at me. Then one night when I was fifteen, she came to my room late at night just in her robe. Romy didn't say anything, swallowing over the lump in her throat. Blue gave her a humorless smile. That night she didn't do anything but stroke my face, tell me what a handsome boy I was. How I looked like a carved statue in one of Italy's great palaces. The next day, she went back to ignoring me. Then a couple of weeks later, she came to my room when I was asleep and got in beside me. I woke to find her, sucking my penis. I was fifteen. Oh no. Romy was horrified. Blue looked desolate. Of course, she told me if I told anyone, she would deny it, and I would be cast out with nothing and nobody. The next night, she put my hand on her genitals and told me to stroke her. I did, because I was so terrified of her. Romy's tears were flooding down her face. Oh my gosh, Blue, I'm so sorry. She raped me for the first time, three weeks shy of my 16th birthday. By then, she had threatened me so many times that I was a shadow of my former self. I was completely under her control. I still can't smell her perfume without being taken back there. The last time was when I was 18, just before I went to Harvard. She knew she was losing control over me, and so was even more threatening. She would have me killed if I told anybody. I didn't doubt she had both the means and the viciousness to do so. He sighed, rubbing his eyes. So I kept the secret, both out of fear of what she would do, shame over feeling that fear, shame over what had happened. I always felt like I would never have been able to say anything, because how would I prove it? So she showed up at your apartment because she was trying to exert influence? Still? Blue nodded. She's wildly jealous of you, of Magda. We still haven't gotten to the reason why she suddenly dropped her bid for more of Dad's fortune. Romy stood up and paced, her sorrow now turning to anger. That skank. She stopped and turned to Blue. And I'll bet all the money in the world Gaius knew she was going to do it. Blue looked surprised. How? He picked me up that night, outside your apartment. He said he was coming to talk with you. I was so intent in getting away that I didn't question it, but... Blue was angry now too, but Romy put her arms around him. Tonight is not the time for retribution. Tonight we're talking, remember? Just you and me. Blue stared down at her. I've never told anyone about what Hillary did to me. Not one person. I was stupid to think I could keep it from you, especially after you trusted me enough to tell me about Mortimer. There are bad, bad people in the world, Romy said quietly. And they all have their reasons, however messed up, to want to hurt us. It's up to us to make sure they can't. Blue stroked the backs of his fingers down her cheek. You're right. Romy leaned into his touch. Blue, we're going to get through this, I swear we will. She took his hand and led him to their bedroom. Let's go to bed, baby. In the morning we'll talk more, and we'll make a plan where to go from here. Blue kissed her tenderly. You got it, beautiful. It seemed only a few moments after they closed their eyes that the call came, and they knew it was about to be one of the worst days of their lives. Chapter 17 so much blood. The floors of the emergency room were covered with it, making the rushing staff slip and slide in it as they tried to cope with the influx of seriously injured and dying patients. A high-speed train had missed a stop signal, plowing into another passenger train at the station. Hundreds were injured, dozens dead, and worst of all, as Mac told Romy as they hurriedly changed into scrubs, there were a lot of families. There are kids, he said, dead-eyed, and Romy felt sick. It was worse than she'd expected. Blue, some of his fellow attendings, and Bo Quinto were all down in the ER or in the operating rooms, desperately trying to save people with horrific injuries. The first few hours saw so many people brought in dead that Romy lost count. The ER was overrun, a war zone, and she yelled out to Mac, Why aren't the other hospitals taking in emergencies? Mac gave a steady look. They are. Geez. 
Romy could not fathom the scope of the accident. On Christmas night too. Warren, the orderly she vaguely knew, helped out, arranging places for the treated to go, and she threw him a grateful glance. You're the best, Warren. He nodded shyly. Romy caught sight of Blue, his face pale and stressed. He nodded to her and mouthed, You okay? She nodded. If she let her feelings take over, she would scream. Bo came over. Romy, we're sending a team into the field. You, Mac, Blue, and myself will go to begin with. Get some supplies together, as many as we can spare, and let's go. As they rode in the ambulance down to the King Street station, Bo briefed them. The station building itself is undamaged, so there's a triage area that has been set up inside. Look, there are a lot of dead and a lot of injured, as you know, but we still have people trapped who might need surgery in situ. It's going to be upsetting and dangerous, but I trust all of you. Stay safe. Even Bo's words could not have prepared them for the horror of what they found in the mangled wreckage. Romy felt her composure slip when she saw the dead bodies of two children, rendered unrecognizable by their injuries, being lifted from the train, and she turned away, taking in deep breaths. People need you. Get a grip. The doctors went to work with the same efficiency they had employed in their own emergency room. Romy worked closely with the first responders both on the track and in the train's vast waiting area. Hours passed, night turned into day turned into night again. Drooping from exhaustion, the medical staff nevertheless kept up their treatment, dispatching as many patients as they could to hospitals in the area. The less injured were ferried down as far as Portland to get beds. Blue came to find Romy as the second night drew on, and they grabbed a couple of private moments together. You okay, bub? She nodded, but she could tell he wasn't convinced. First major incident? She half laughed. Yep, having a lot of firsts this year. He hugged her tightly. Bo says another hour and he'll call it. Okay. I'm just going to do another sweep of the place. Okay, I'll take the other end of the station. See you in a few. Romy clambered back down onto the tracks, careful to avoid the third rail, even though they had been assured the power had been switched off. She scooted behind the pile of wreckage and searched around in the dark. Her foot slipped on some blood and she wobbled, falling backwards, but thankfully was caught by two strong arms. Thanks, she said breathlessly, turning to face her savior, but before she could see who it was, he grabbed her head and slammed it hard against the steel of the wreckage. Romy didn't even have time to cry out as he attacked her, hitting her head repeatedly against the steel, until she was almost unconscious. Blood was pouring from her forehead into her eyes, and she could feel herself weakening. Hello, my darling, a familiar, horrifying voice growled in her ear as she blacked out. How ironic that your life should end here, Rome, as you do your Florence Nightingale thing. No, no, it couldn't be, this wasn't how it ended. Romy found she couldn't move her arms to fight him off, and as he slipped his hands around her throat, all she could think of was Blue. Gosh, Blue, I'm sorry, I love you. Romy. The pressure on her throat stopped, and she heard Dacres muffled. Damn. Suddenly she knew she was alone and that her would-be killer had gone, but now the darkness was beginning to cloud her vision, and the last thing she remembered was Blue's anguished cry. Chapter 18 Bo's handsome face was set and grim as he faced the television cameras. As you know by now, we have confirmed 78 deaths, 153 seriously injured and 47 minor injuries in the King Street Station rail crash. I and my team were on hand to help the first responders, and I would like to thank them for their exceptional service. My team, both with me at the station and here at Rainier Hope, has worked tirelessly for over 48 hours since the accident, and I applaud every one of them. He looked down for a moment, trying to rein in his anger. Unfortunately, shockingly, during the operation to save the lives of as many victims as possible, one of our doctors, Dr. Romy Sass, was attacked and seriously injured by an unknown assailant. Dr. Sass is currently being treated at Rainer Hope for head injuries. We ask anyone who was in the vicinity of the King Street station on the 26th of December to come forward with any information they may have. Quinto looked directly into the camera. 
Whoever you are, you should know. No one attacks my staff and gets away with it. Whoever you are, you will be brought to justice. Blue clicked off the television, grateful for his boss's support. In the bed next to him, Romy opened her eyes as she'd been doing intermittently for a while, but this time her eyes focused on him. Blue. He let out a shaky breath. Thank God, baby, I was so scared. How do you feel? A little woozy. Do you remember what happened? Blue asked, leaning down to stroke her hair gently. Romy nodded, then winced. Dacre was choking me until he heard you call my name. You saved me, baby. I shouldn't have taken my eyes off of you, he said, his eyes sorrowful. You can't watch me 24-7, and we had a job to do. Who knew Dacre was psycho enough to do that? Come to think of it, how the hell did he know I was down there? And why would he risk trying to kill me there, with the police all around? He's insane. Well, we knew that. Anyway, don't think of that, just get well. That's all I care about right now. Romy leaned back further into the pillows. I honestly feel okay, which surprises me. He really did a number on my head. They gave you a CT scan before anything. No brain bleeds, thank God, but you'll be concussed for a few days. Romy pushed the covers on the bed back and swung her legs over the side. Blue was up in an instant. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where are you going? A concussion I can deal with at home, Blue, Romy said, frowning as he caught her and made her sit again. I'm taking up a bed when I don't need it. Blue sighed. You're not going anywhere, Romy. Bo wanted to keep you in for observation, and he's the boss. You need the beds for the train victims. He shook his head. Honey, the less seriously injured were taken to hospitals out of the city in anticipation that we would need more beds. His voice was gravelly. We didn't need as many beds as we hoped we would. Oh gosh, Romy groaned. How many? 78 dead, over 150 serious, and more than a third of those critical. It was a bad smash, baby. Merry Christmas. Indeed. He stroked her face and she leaned into his hand. You might not feel it now because you still have morphine in your system, but honey, you're going to have one hell of a headache when it wears off. So bed rest. I'm going to be here the whole time. Romy sighed and got back into bed, reaching up to feel the pattern of butterfly stitches on her head. Will I at least have some awesome scars? Blue chuckled softly. No, you bled a lot, but the wounds in themselves weren't too serious. The bruising is the main thing. Can I see? Blue looked at her askance, then nodded. He went into the ensuite bathroom to fetch a mirror. You were one of those kids who bragged when you skinned your knees, right? Hell yes. She took the mirror from him. Whoa. Her entire forehead was an angry thundercloud of purple, black, and red, crisscrossed by the white of the stitches. Yep, this is the look. You kind of look like that chick from that film with the road race. Penelope Pit Stop? Blue laughed. No, the Charlize Theron character from Mad Max. Romy looked impressed. Furiosa. Yeah, baby. She pulled Blue over to kiss him. Now that's some roleplay I could get into. Ahem. They both looked up to see a tired looking but smiling Beau at the door. Am I interrupting? Not at all. Romy smiled at him. He came into the room, winking at Blue before checking Romy's vitals. Good. That's all good. So I can go home. Romy looked hopeful as Blue rolled his eyes. Bo grinned. Not on your life. At least overnight, Dr. Sass, your chief's orders. Listen, his smile faded and he pulled up a chair, the police will want to talk to you. I've spoken to the hospital board. We're going to be intensifying the security around here. There will more scrutiny on visitors, on staff. I can't tell you how sorry I am about the attack. Thanks, boss. Bo left them alone a little while later, and Blue kissed Romy's hand. When they let you out, we're going away for a few days. I've cleared it with Bo. Romy sank back onto the pillows. Her head was beginning to pound painfully now. Okay. 
She closed her eyes for a moment, then let out a distressed gasp. Gosh, Mom. You didn't call her, did you? It was on the news, I had to call Stuart. He told me he would break it to her gently. I don't want them coming back and ruining their honeymoon. Blue stroked her sore head. I think I persuaded them not to. Thank God. Romy leaned into Blue's touch. I think I need to sleep now. You go right ahead. Do you want some painkillers? Romy nodded, wincing, and when Blue came back with the tablets, she swallowed them gratefully, draining her water glass. She felt exhausted, drained, and now that the adrenaline had left her system, the shock of the attack was getting to her. She closed her eyes before they could fill with tears and fell into an uneasy sleep. Gaius was beside himself with rage. You damn fool. Do you know how many cops were at the accident? You tried and kill her there? Dacre waited until Gaius had ranted himself out, then narrowed his eyes at the other man. I didn't intend to kill Romy, just scare the crap out of her. I promise you, it worked. But you could have been seen, all the work we've done to get you close to her, could have been undone. You mean like if someone had tried to split them up, before we got to finish what we set out to do? Like your skank mother? Dacre enjoyed the dark rage in Gaia's face. Believe me, my mother and I are going to have a serious talk. Gosh. Gaius Express was pure disgust. How could she have slept with that Italian son of a gun? Dacre said nothing, just smirked. Gaius stared at him in dislike. Dacre growled and Gaius smirked. Yeah, that sticks in your craw, doesn't it? Not for much longer. Well, this time, stick to what we planned and we'll get everything we ever wanted. Dacre nodded but said nothing. Gaius had been useful up to now, but there was no way Dacre would tell him what his real plan was. Something that would make Romy's last moments on Earth a living hell. Chapter 19 After three days, Bo discharged Romy, and Blue immediately whisked her onto his private jet and flew them both to Italy. As she stepped out into the mild Italian winter and felt the sun on her skin, Romy sighed happily. Yeah, this is what I needed. She smiled at Blue, who was loading their cases into the big hire car. She loved that rich as he was, Blue preferred to do things himself rather than hire a staff. He drove them through the Tuscan countryside, past olive groves, vineyards, and avenues of cypress trees, until he pointed out a large villa on top of a hill. There it is. Romy saw a terracotta-colored stone villa nestled into the hill, and as they approached, she sighed. Gosh, it's beautiful. And ours, Blue grinned at her surprise. Merry Christmas, baby. Romy gaped at him. You bought this place? Blue laughed. Almost. I wanted you to have a say, so I'm holding off until you give the final say as to whether I sign the papers. But yeah. I wanted to surprise you. You certainly did that. At the villa, Blue dumped their cases in the lobby. Then, taking Romy's hand, he walked her through the villa. Exposed brick, billowing white drapes, bookcases, hand-turned wooden furniture, the whole place was a romantic dream. Romy went from room to room, open-mouthed. Gosh, Blue, I thought these types of places only existed in the movies. You like. I love. Blue laughed, delighted. Good. I'm glad you think so. Come see the kitchen. The kitchen was a vast open-plan room with an open fire as well as a state-of-the-art stove and range, and a huge wooden table marked from years of use. Dried herbs hung from the walls, and there were three comfy couches at one end. This is the heart of the house, Romy said. You can just tell this is where the people congregate, eat, drink, love. Gosh, can you imagine our family here? Everyone bustling around, Mom taking over the cooking, Juno flopped on the one of the couches. Our kids running around. Blue smiled as she looked up at him. Someday, hopefully. He kissed her softly, then as she responded, the kiss became fiercer before he broke away, breathless, studying her. Do you feel okay? Romy nodded. In truth, the injury was still giving her headaches, but she wanted Blue so badly, she pushed aside any doubts. She pressed her body against him. Take me to bed, Allende. 
Blue swept her into his arms and strode through the villa, grinning down at her. I'm going to kiss every inch of you, pretty girl. Blue made love to her tenderly, a little hesitantly, conscious that she wasn't fully recovered. The bruises on her lovely face were a daily reminder of how close he had been to losing her, and it gnawed away at his gut. Who attacked a doctor at the scene of an accident? Why the hell would Dacre Mortimer risk so much? When Romy fell asleep, Blue lay awake, his mind whirling with anger and love and confusion. He'd hired the security team, even here, in Italy, they weren't far away. He hadn't wanted Romy to feel trapped, so he'd kept that information to himself, but it reassured him that no one could get to them here. He could relax, and Romy could heal. He eventually fell asleep, and was awoken by soft kisses from Romy. He smiled without opening his eyes. You taste so sweet, baby. I love you, Blue. Let's just keep doing this for the rest of our lives. You've got a deal, he grinned and kissed her again. I've never felt like this, ever, she said in a whisper, touching his face tenderly. Probably just the concussion, Blue chuckled and she laughed. No way. This is it for me, Blue. This is real. This is what life is meant to be about. I couldn't agree more Romy's sass. He wrapped himself around her, looking deep into her eyes. Marry me. Marry me today or tomorrow or however soon we can arrange it. Romy stared back at him and for a long moment he thought she might say no. If she is sensible, he thought, she will say no. But gosh please please Romy say. Yes? For a moment Blue didn't comprehend her answer then as it sank it, he whooped loudly overwhelmed as Romy giggled. He rolled her around on the bed, cheering and laughing until they were both breathless. After they'd calmed down, he stroked the hair away from her face. Really? Really? Gosh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mio Dio, Mio Dio. One condition. Yes? We have the ceremony in Italian. It's only fitting. Blue grinned at her. I'll coach you on the language. Romy giggled. I'll have people check that you haven't made me agree to some kind of deviancy. Damn you caught me. Blue propped himself up on his elbow, grinning down at her. And I thought you'd like that. Oh I would, Romy laughed. But you don't have to make me agree to it, it's implicit. And two days later, that was exactly what he did. Chapter 20 Octavia Hellman grinned at the message on her phone, and her friend Mandy nudged her. What is it? My sister just got married on a whim in Italy. That's romantic. Wait, what sister? Mandy, who had known Octavia since the beginning of high school, looked confused. I thought you were an only child. Octavia grinned and explained her relationship to Romy and the Sasses. Ha, huh, Mandy said, when Octavia saw a photo of Romy. She does look like you. Sure she didn't donate eggs 17 years ago. I think not, she would have been 12. Octavia rolled her eyes at her friend. Her mom could have though. I'm just saying. They were sitting in the cafeteria of the library, waiting for two of their friends to join them. The new year had brought even more snow, and the girls were heading out to do some sledding before retreating to Octavia's house for hot chocolate and pizza. Rebecca, a fiery redhead, yelled over to them as she entered the cafe, always one to show off but good-natured, and then quiet but sweet Yelena followed her in. The dark-haired girl had been an emigre from Russian five years ago, and before meeting the others, had felt left out and lonely. Octavia had brought her into their fold of tomboys and book nerds, and now Yelena was thriving. They set out in Octavia's 4x4 to go to her father's cabin up in the mountains. Dan hadn't been wild about the idea of four teenage girls alone out there, but Octavia had gently reminded him, they were all adults now. Almost, he said with narrowed eyes, but Octavia had stared him down. Dad. Dan sighed. Fine, but you call me when you get there and text every morning and night. Deal. They reached the cabin after dark and hurriedly brought their luggage inside. Octavia lit the fire and Yelena made some hot chocolate. 
They sat around chatting and laughing until late, then Octavia stretched her long limbs. Gonna turn in, I think. Want to be ready for a full-on day tomorrow. Hell yes. Rebecca raised her mug, cursing as she slopped it all over her. Mandy rolled her eyes and helped her clean it up. Octavia was the last to fall asleep. She was sharing the room with Mandy, her friend curled up beside her, fast asleep. Octavia snuggled under the covers and closed her eyes. It was almost dawn when she heard it. A soft cry from the other bedroom woke her. She sat up, listening intently. She heard a strange noise, like a thumping into something soft. What the hell? She swung her legs over the side of the bed and crept out into the hall, moving silently along. As she approached the other room, she began to tremble, something didn't feel right. The door was slightly ajar, and to her horror, she saw the hooded figure of a tall man bending over her friend's bed. He was moving his arm up and down, and in the moonlight, Octavia saw the glint of steel. Oh gosh no! For a second she was frozen, not believing what she was seeing then, with nothing else to do, she gave a banshee scream and run to tackle the assailant. She hit him full force but he threw her off easily, sending her crashing back to the wall, banging her head viciously. As she recovered, she heard Mandy running to help. No Mandy run, get help. But it was too late. Mandy came crashing through the door, flicking the light on, and then Octavia saw the horror of what had happened. Rebecca and Yelena, both gasping for oxygen, covered in blood, were clutching at the vicious stab wounds in their bellies. October, Mandy, run, Rebecca croaked before the killer shoved the blade into her throat, and she fell back, choking and dying. Octavia scrambled to her feet pushing Mandy back out into the hall, but then there was another masked man, easily picking Mandy up and driving a knife deep into her abdomen so many times, so quickly that Mandy had no chance. The killer dumped her body on the ground, and then both of them came after Octavia. She almost reached the cabin door, but then one of them tackled her to the ground, the other grabbing her legs and straddling her. He ripped the top of her pajamas open, then to Octavia's disbelief, he pulled his mask off. Gaius. He grinned down at her. Well now I guess I'm quite the surprise. Please don't kill me Gaius, please. He laughed, looking at the other assailant. Well, it's always worth asking, isn't it? He slowly pushed the knife into her navel, and Octavia gasped at the horrific pain. Gaius buried the knife into her to the hilt. I did some research, little Octavia, some digging around in the files of the surrogacy place. Seems like we're related. Magda Sass is your biological mother, which makes you Romy's sister, which means we're going to kill you the same way we're going to kill her. Slowly. Painfully. Without mercy. He wrenched the knife from her, and Octavia could feel her blood pumping from the wound. Gaius smiled. Ah damn. I think I've gone and severed your abdominal artery. You'll bleed out in a few minutes, so we'd better make the most of this. Octavia screamed as the other killer drew his own knife out of his pocket, and both men stabbed her again and again, until there was nothing left but darkness. Chapter 21 Romy Sassayende rolled over in bed and smiled at her husband. Hey hubby. How did I ever exist before you, Romy Sass? Romy grinned up at him. Romy Sassayende. And I don't know, Blue, because there was nothing before you. He grinned. I think we just exceeded our cheese quote for the year. Romy laughed. I don't care. This is our honeymoon, gorgeous man, cheesy is a requirement. You know what's also a requirement? What? Food. I'm starving. Blue drove them into Florence to a favorite restaurant of his, and they dined on lobster and pasta and garlic bread. Blue ordered some wine and they lingered over desserts of Zubiglione with fresh berries. The coffee was strong and dark, and they sat talking long into the evening. Romy leaned her head on Blue's shoulder. I'm so chilled right now. This place is heavenly. I'm glad you think so. So, what's the verdict? Should I close on the villa? Romy nodded, smiling. Blue, we haven't discussed kids, but I think the villa would be the perfect place to bring them up. He smiled warmly. 
I do too, baby. Across the street was a row of stores, each different, none of them brand names, all family owned, some of them still open this late in the evening. There was something so pure and natural about this place, Romy thought. Her eye was caught by the flickering of a television in the bar across the street. For a moment, she couldn't believe what she was seeing. Tavia. No, it couldn't be. Her young friend's face flashed up again, and Romy saw now that the news channel was focusing on a snowbound crime scene, police tape fluttering around a small log cabin. Romy stood up to move closer to the television, and Blue, hurriedly throwing a wad of euros down to pay for their meal, followed her. They had been cut off from cell phone and internet access for a few days, and both had enjoyed it, but now Romy stared in horror at the television. Can you turn that up, please? she asked anyone who would listen. Blue repeated the question in Italian, and the bartender grabbed the remote and increased the volume. The four young women, all aged 17, were found stabbed to death this morning by the owner of this isolated log cabin. It is believed he is also one of the girl's father, local businessman Daniel Helmond. No. Romy's legs gave way as Blue dived to catch her. No, 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 not Tavia, please, please, not Tavia. She was screaming, not caring that the entire street was staring at her. The victims have now been officially identified as Rebecca Moore, Octavia Helmond, Mandy Fitkins, and Yelena Shostakovich. All the women were from Kings County, Seattle. All were brutal stabbed to death. Police say the killer or killers left very little physical evidence of themselves and have asked that anyone with any information come forward. Back to the studio. Two hours later, when Romy had finally gotten through to a devastated Artemis, she spoke with her sister for a few minutes, then came back to the table. She was calm now, too calm, Blue thought, as he stood to take her in his arms. The restaurant was officially closed, but the owner was a kindly man who told them to take all the time they needed to make calls. He kept them supplied with hot, strong coffee and pastries, although neither Blue or Romy could eat. Romy leaned against her new husband's body. We have to go back. It's Dacre. He'll keep killing innocent women. We have to draw him out. Romy. No, Blue. No objections. It's the only thing left to do. She looked up into his eyes, and he could see the endless sorrow in them. I won't go down without a fight. And I'll play dirty, Blue, believe me. You're not in this alone. I know. She sighed, squeezing her eyes shut to stop them from tearing up again. She felt raw from screaming. For tonight, let's go home. I'll book the plane for tomorrow. Thank you, baby. Dacre and Gaius watched the news with satisfaction, then Gaius grabbed a couple of beers from his fridge. Dacre clinked his bottle against Gaius, and then sat back, studying the other man. How did it feel? Your first kill? Gaius smiled. Godlike. Dacre laughed. I'll drink to that. He took a long swig. Romy will be on her way back to the States now. So her sister says. Dacre sighed. It's time, man. When we were killing those girls, all I could think of was doing the same thing to Romy. Sticking that knife into her gut over and over. I got hard just thinking about it. Gaius nodded. I agree, it's time. Dacre was deep in thought. The best place to do it will be at the hospital. No one suspects me there, hell she doesn't even recognize me. Well, you did do a transformation from preppy asshole to redneck psycho. Gaius smiled as Dacre laughed. Yeah, she won't see you coming. Both. Gaius' eyes glittered with malice. I'm going to beat him to within an inch of his life, then drag him to watch you kill Romy. How does that sound? Dacre's smile spread slowly across his face. Dude, that sounds just about perfect. Chapter 22 The funeral was well attended and as painful as they all expected. Octavia's coffin was lowered into the cold January ground. Dan, her father, had such a look of desolation on his face that Romy could barely look at him. The guilt she felt was overwhelming, and since she and Blue had flown back to Seattle a week ago, she had been working with the police to try and smoke Dacre out. 
At the hospital, she and Blue had had a conference with Bo and the head of security and decided the measures would stay for now. I'm not risking your life or anyone else's, Romy. Bo said, I've had experience at the vengeful X thing. My Dinah nearly died. I know, Bo, and thank you. Romy looked between the two men. I'm so sorry for bring this all down on your heads. It's not your fault. Blue repeated for what seemed the hundredth time, but Romy couldn't help but feel it pressing down on her. Octavia's horrific murder had affected the whole family. Dan, to his credit, hadn't blamed her, or Artemis, but Romy almost wanted him to yell and scream at her. At night, after she and Blue were in bed, after her adored husband was asleep, his arms tight around her, Romy would lie awake thinking up ways to bait Dacre into revealing himself, and then coming up with increasing violent ways to kill him herself. Her rage was all-consuming. She would sleep for a couple of hours then get up, grab her laptop, and go through all the information she could find on Dacre, his family, the murders. On more than one morning, Blue had found her asleep on the couch, her laptop still open. She knew Blue was worried about her, and couldn't blame him for being so. Never, even after the attack of the previous year, had she felt so on edge, like she was on a tightrope and nothing could stop her from falling. Only at work could she focus on what she was doing. She and Blue were even more in tune in the operating theater, and even their recent marriage hadn't affected her relationship with her colleagues, much to her relief. Mac was the only other resident who knew everything. Romy found she was leaning on him more and more, someone outside their family, a friend, a sounding post. She had told him, then told him to forget it. Everything I talk about now seems to be about Dacre she said, with a sad smile. Promise me that when we talk we'll bust each other's chops or just talk about work or our love lives, rather, your love life. Max smiled, his smile splitting his handsome face and lighting it up. You got it, gorgeous. And he kept his word, joking with her, relieving some of that stress. Romy had never been so grateful to someone as she was to Mac. Magda, back from her honeymoon, was stressed out and hyper when Romy went over to her house to visit. After Magda had hugged her for way too long, Romy escaped her mother's arms and rolled her eyes. Mom, I'm fine. It's Artie and Dan you should be worried about. Oh, I am, Magda said, grim-faced, but Dacre's not trying to kill them, is he? She sighed and covered her face, and to her distress, Romy saw her mother was crying. She went to her. Mom, I have protection coming out of my ears. Look at the two hulking guys I had to bring with me to come visit. Dacre's not going to get to me, unless I let him. Magda dropped her hands and glared at her daughter. What does that mean? Unless you let him? Romy silently cursed herself for the slip. Just a figure of speech, Mom, chill out. Magda sighed, her usually youthful face seeming older. When you were in the hospital last year, Magda said, I sat with you, and in my head I was making up ways I could kill Dacre Mortimer. Some pretty hardcore things. Romy half-smiled. You and me both, Mom. Magda nodded, hesitated, then fixed Romy with a steady look. Could you? Could you do it? Kill him. Romy, grim-faced, nodded. I wouldn't even hesitate. Magda nodded. Good. Gosh, Romy, I hate that I couldn't protect you then, and can't protect you now. What are you talking about? You gave me and Artie and Junebug the best childhood ever. Ever, Mom. The love in this house, that was all down to you. That we've all followed out dreams, that's all because of you. You are my superhero, Mom. Magda was openly crying now, and Romy wrapped her arms around her mother. Mom, we will get through this. Magda nodded. She looked at Romy. Darling, there's something I have to tell you. Romy, trying to lighten the mood, smiled at her. Did Stuart knock you up? She regretted the joke immediately when she saw her mother wince. Gosh, Mom, what is it? Darling, come sit down. This isn't going to be easy. Later that night, Blue came home to find Romy sitting in the dark. He knew at once that something had happened, and he sat down beside her. What is it? Romy looked at him, and the sorrow in her eyes was bottomless and searing. Octavia was my sister. The police told Artemis and Dad that she matched Mom's DNA. 
Mom told me that 20 years ago, she donated her eggs after she'd had Juno. She knew she was done, so she and Dad had eggs fertilized and donated. That's why Tavia looked just like me. We were sisters. Gosh no. Blue felt the shock reverberating through his body. Romy looked at him, eerily calm. This ends now, Blue. No more. If it kills me, Dacre Mortimer is going down. Blue looked at his wife unhappily. This won't end well, Romy. I know, baby, but we will prevail. We will be ready. Romy had no idea how soon she would have to put her theory into practice. Chapter 23 Bo wasn't happy, but eventually he agreed to Romy's request that her protection at the hospital be removed. At least the visible protection, Blue amended with a glance at his wife. Romy's determined to draw him out. He knows I'm in Seattle, he knows I work here. Romy looked at Blue. Blue's arranged for a journalist to interview me about the murders. I'm going to goad him in the press so that he has no option but to come after me. Bo exchanged a look with Blue and Romy sighed. Fellas, it's up to me. I'm the one he wants, and I won't let anyone dictate my life. Later, she was working in the residence lounge when Warren, the friendly orderly, knocked on the door. Hey, Dr. Sass, can I run something past you? Romy smiled at him. Go for it. Warren came in and sat down. Staff's been talking. About what's going on with you and this jerk ex of yours. Romy felt a little awkward. People are talking. Yeah, sorry if that's inappropriate, but we look after our own around here. Romy smiled at him. That's sweet, but I think we got it handled. I'm just saying. I'm around. You ever feel threatened, I got your back. Romy was moved. Oren, you're the best, but I think I got this. I can be pretty badass. Oren laughed. I have no doubt. Well, I said what I wanted to, so? Thanks, Warren. I do appreciate it. After the orderly had gone, Romy felt strange, like somehow her friends and colleagues were looking at her as if she were a victim. Gosh, that was the last thing she needed. Her stomach roiled and she pushed away from the table and got up, determined to stop feeling sorry for herself. The hospital was quiet now as the day ended, and Romy checked the surgical schedule, seeing that Blue was still operating on an elderly woman with appendicitis. She checked on all of their post-surgical patients and set out about updating the medical records. She'd just glanced at the clock and seen it was nearly 2 a.m. when she heard the first shot. Freezing for a moment, she wondered if it was a car backfiring in the lot. Then when she heard the screams starting, Romy began to run towards the sound of the shooting, joined quickly by other staff and the hospital's security team. More gunfire and security stopped the medical staff. Shootings coming from the OR floor. Romy's heart nearly failed, and she darted forward only to be stopped by one of the security guards. Sorry, Doc, we can't let you go down there. But Blue is there, Rom said, her voice rising as the panic set in. Mac grabbed her upper arm. Romy, come on. We need to take care of our patients. Let the security team do their job. Hospital is on lockdown, the security chief was telling them all. Go back to where you were and secure your patients as best you can. Mac dragged Romy back to the post-surgical patients. Some of them were awake now, wondering what was going on. Romy tried to reassure them, but when the gunfire came closer, there was a palpable sense of panic. Let's get the patients who can't walk and can't hide into secure rooms, Mac said, and Romy nodded, her stomach roiling with panic. She grabbed her cell phone and texted Blue. Are you safe? There was no answer. When she saw the head of security again, she grabbed him. What's going on? Shooter. He looked at her as if she was stupid, and Romy rolled her eyes. I know that, where is he or she? Is anyone hurt? I don't know, Doc. It's a developing situation. He moved away before she had a chance to ask any more questions, and she hissed in frustration. She tried to call Blue, but knowing he switched off his cell phone when he was in surgery, prayed that was the reason he wasn't answering. Please, please be okay. 
Gosh, how much more horror would they have to put up with? Romy did her job, helped patients, made sure the floor was secure, but she couldn't help wondering how the hell a man with a gun got into the hospital. Was it because Bo had reduced the security at her request? Don't be stupid, this has nothing to do with you. But her instincts were telling her otherwise. Romy felt her composure slip, and she darted into an empty room and dragged some deep breaths into her lungs. He's fine, he's okay. There was a soft knock on the door. Yes? Warren opened the door and gave her a hesitant smile. You okay, Doc? She shook her head. No. There's a shooter down on the OR floor and Blue is there. No, I'm not okay, Warren. They won't let me go to him. He stared at her for a long moment then said, I can get you down there. Romy's eyes widened. You can? Warren nodded, his eyes watchful as he gazed at her. I can. Come with me. Romy didn't even think twice, such was her need to get to Blue. She followed Warren into the far end of the floor, raising her eyebrows as he opened the fire escape. No alarm. No, they shut the power down on the doors to contain the shooter, which knocked out the alarms. But this door has always been tricky. She followed him down two flights of stairs then as he passed the OR floor, she faltered. Warren? He turned and grabbed her hand, pulling her after him. We have to go down to go up, Rome. It took a second to process what he'd called her, and a wave of utter horror swept over her. What did you call me? Warren's hand tightened on her wrist as he turned back towards her. Miss me, Rome? It couldn't be. Romy stared at the big man in horror, and began to see it. Dacre had completely changed his body type, his hair was gone, the thick beard, the piercings, but yes, it was her ex-husband. How did I not see it, she said out loud, and as Dacre pulled her into his grip, he laughed. Because you didn't want to. You've only had eyes for the Italian, haven't you? His hands all over you? He was dragging her down the stairs, her petite body no match for his strength. They'll find your body in the basement, Rome, gutted, bled out. Of course by that time I'll be long gone. They'll still be looking for whoever is shooting up the hospital. That was you? Killing more innocent people? There is no shooter. The dumb security team is going through the hospital, trying to find someone who isn't there. I set it up so someone would fire blanks nearby and panic everybody. Confused by his certainty, Romy was trying desperately to put her hand in her pocket. She had a hypodermic needle in there, if she could just reach it, she could use it as a weapon. Her fingers closed around it, and with all her might, she gripped it in her fist and plunged it backwards, aiming for Dacre's face. She felt resistance then, as Dacre howled and released her, she knew she'd hit her mark. Dacre jerked back, the needle piercing his left eye. Romy didn't wait around. He was blocking the way upwards, so she went down, practically flying down the staircase. In her pocket, her cell phone began to buzz. Blue. Baby, where are you? The freakiest thing, there's some kind of. Blue. It's Dacre, he's here, he's after me. I'm in staircase C and I don't know where I can get away from him. Gosh, baby, go down as far as you can, to the basement, you can get to the foyer. From there I. There was a scuffling noise, and she heard Blue cry out in anger and pain, and Romy screamed. Blue. Romy. And then the phone went dead. What the hell was going on? Behind her, she heard Dacre crashing down the stairs after her. What the hell had happened to Blue? She pushed her way into the basement of the hospital, a vast labyrinth of pipes and dank corridors. Romy ran as fast as she could, towards what she thought was the front of the hospital. Dacre was almost on her as she flung the door open and ran out into the foyer of the hospital. Dacre grabbed her and they both tumbled to the floor, Romy struggling with his vast weight on top of her. Even a glimpse at the blade of the knife he pulled out made her mad rather than scared, and she kicked and bit and clawed at him as he tried to subdue her. No, she screamed at him, you don't get to win this time, Dacre. Never again. He laughed at her, cuffing her viciously around the face. Give it up, skank, it was always going to end this way. He was winning, his sheer physical size overpowering her. 
He bounced Romy's head off the cold hard floor and as she reeled, he pinned her. His mouth ground down on hers, his tongue penetrating her mouth. Romy bit down on it as hard as she could, tasting blood, and Dacre roared in pain and anger. He drew back his arm, ready to stab her, but then everything stopped. Dacre's eyes widened suddenly as blood began to pour from his chest. Romy whimpered as he fell forward onto her, then kicked him off of her, her eyes whirling wildly around the room. Behind them, Gaius Eames lowered the gun he was holding. Romy hadn't even heard the shot. Gaius. He came to her immediately, helping her to her feet, his expression incredulous. Are you all right? Are you hurt? Romy leaned against him, relieved to find a friendly face even if it was Gaius. My ex-husband. And no, I'm not hurt. Good. He pressed his lips to her temple, wrapping his arm around her, and Romy felt comforted. Blue. I have to get to Blue. Gaius nodded and tucked his gun in his pants. Romy blinked. Gaius, why do you have a gun? I have a permit to carry a concealed weapon, he said, shrugging. He nodded at Dacre's body. Thankfully. Amen to that, but you might want to be careful. He set it up, so it sounded like someone was shooting up the place, and if security sees you with a weapon. Gaius nodded. Yeah, let's get out of here. Find Blue and get out. They made their way carefully to the OR floor. It was dark, silent, and Romy felt a coldness settle over her. She could smell cordite in the air. OR 3. That was where Blue had been operating. She led Gaius towards it, the smell of gunsmoke stronger. Romy pushed her way into the scrub room and looked through the window. The OR was a mess, blood, instruments, drapes everywhere. She pushed into the room and saw him. He was covered in blood and Romy screamed, dropping to her knees by his side. Blue. He opened his eyes, the bright green stark against the blood on his face. He smiled. You're here. Are you shot? Romy was running her hands over his body, trying to find wounds. Blue shook his head. No, he only hit me. Gosh, Romy, I never knew. I never knew he hated me that much. Ice flooded through her veins. Dacre didn't even know you, Blue, he just wanted you out of the way. Blue looked confused. No, not Dacre, Romy. He trailed off as he looked behind her and his face went pale. Romy. Romy whirled around to find Gaius, smiling at them both and aiming the gun at Blue. No, Romy, Dacre didn't know much about Blue. He wanted to kill you, beautiful, and I offered to help, as long as Blue was made to witness your murder. Then, well, Dacre became a loose end. After we killed your, what was she, sister? Octavia, anyhow, and her friends, I knew I wanted to do you myself, but Dacre wouldn't hear of it. So he had to go. Romy was staring at him aghast, then with a scream she threw herself at Gaius. He had anticipated it, and easily threw her off, but not before Blue had a chance to scramble to his feet and go after his half-brother. You weasel! Figlia di Patana. Gaius was a big man, but nothing to Blue's strength. The two men crashed to the floor, and Romy cast around desperately for something to help Blue. She grabbed a scalpel and leapt at Gaius, slashing at him. She caught his arm and he yelled as Blue landed a punch so hard that Gaius fell backward. As he scrambled away from them, he pulled out his gun. Blue stopped as Gaius aimed it at him. Gaius, don't be stupid. Killing me won't help you. This place is crawling with cops. They'll cut you down in an instant. Gaius stared at him as Blue and Romy, holding their breaths, stood still. Then Gaius's mouth hitched up in a smile. You're right and he swung his arm and shot Romy. The bullet smashed into her belly and she dropped as Blue, half crazed with grief, went for Gaius. Gaius was too quick for him, putting the gun to his own temple. You slept with my mom, he said, sounding like a child. Blue shook his head. She raped me, Gaius. No. Blue, seeing the half-crazed expression in Gaius' eyes, but desperate to get to Romy, crouched next to his half-brother. Don't do it, Gaius. Your mom is a bad person, but she loves you. Gaius half smiled. She's nothing anymore. I strangled her to death the day after I found out she slept with you. 
They've probably found her body by now. Blue was horrified. Geez, Gaius. Gaius was staring at Romy now, who was clutching at her bleeding stomach, but calmly, deeply breathing, watching the scene play. She's lovely, Blue. So lovely. I'm glad I got to kill her before I died. And he put the gun in his own mouth and pulled the trigger. Blue didn't hesitate. He went to Romy and gathered her into his arms. Romy stared up at him, still unnaturally calm. Blue, she said in a steady voice, Blue, save our baby. Please save our little one. I love you so much. Her eyes closed and she passed out. Shell shocked, Blue swept her out of the room and into an unused OR. Keeping his hand pressed to the bullet wound, he grabbed his phone. Bo, oh, the shooter is dead. But Romy's been shot. I need a team in OR2 right now. Please help me save my girl and our child. Please. His voice shook, but he knew that to lose control now was to sentence Romy to death. Please, Bo. I need you right now. Chapter 24 Romy opened her eyes and wondered why she felt no pain. It's the morphine doofus. She breathed in a lungful of sweet pure air and smiled. Looking around the room, she saw Blue checking her chart. He glanced up and grinned. Hey, beautiful. Get over here and kiss me, Iende. Such a nag. But he pressed his lips to hers and they kissed until they had to break away to breathe. He stroked her cheek. How do you feel? Good, really good. Blue, how's our baby? He or she is doing just fine. How come you didn't tell me? I was going to, but I hadn't even taken a test yet. Romy sighed, putting her hand on her belly. I can't be more than a couple of weeks, I just had a feeling. Three weeks to be precise, Blue grinned, covering her hand with his. I can't wait to meet him or her. We're really going to do this, right? Romy felt nervous and excited and Blue laughed. You bet we are. We got married on a roller coaster ride, we're gonna start our family the same way. You in this adventure with me? Romy gazed up at her husband and grinned. Just try and stop me. Three months later. Blue smiled at his excited wife. I honestly thought you'd fight me on this. Are you kidding? This is our honeymoon, Blue. We earned this. They were flying in Blue's private jet down to the Caribbean and to one of the lesser-known islands, owned by a friend of Blue's. Romy had recovered quickly from the shooting, and now, their child growing in her belly, she was ready to return to work. Blue, however, had insisted on them taking some time together first, and so for the next two blissful weeks they would make love, laze in the sun, eat whatever they wanted. I cannot wait. You and me forever, baby. Romy grinned and squeezed his butt playfully as she nodded. You bet, Orgis man. And they made love again as the plane came in to land in their Caribbean paradise. The End Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio copyright, 2023 BFA Publishing. Please like and subscribe to support this channel, it helps more than you know.